with Broken Crown. All right, Artos. Just, I got to tell you, man, I could not be more excited mm. to get into this finals. And, and what a great story this is with these two players. They're so talented. Uh, I think we could be happy no matter who takes us. And we're going to really figure out who has truly mastered Infernal versus Infernal in this current state. Yeah, yeah. This is going to be very exciting. I'm, I, I'm not exactly sure what the, the score is going to look like. I do, again, feel like parting is going to be in good shape for this since he hasn't had to show that much. But it's great to see these two old school pro gamers meet up again here in Stormgate and see who's gotten better over the years. All right, guys, we're going to hop into our game now. This is the grand finals here uh, for EGC TV, the first ever major StarCraft tournament that's been open to the public. Over here in the top right in the red, the former StarCraft II world champion, he is Party. Mm. And uh, just... <laughs> <laughs> and his opponent down here in the bottom left, uh, over here in the blue... One of the most talented players in so many different professional gaming titles. He is Vortex. Yeah, it's really, it's a fantastic matchup, honestly. Uh, you know, Vortex, it was always, it was a really sad thing, honestly, when he left the StarCraft II scene, went over to Heroes. And, you know, obviously he's moved on from there to age four at this point, but he's just, he's always been such a talent and with such a fun style as well. How is that going to match up against someone who honestly has a very similar style? They're playing the same faction here with Infernal versus Infernal. And honestly, the builds look really similar right now as well. Yeah, one big feature of this map is the fact that at your natural expansion, there are trees that can be torn down with workers or, or other units with other abilities later on. So that makes it a little bit trickier if you're going to fast expand. There's also mm -hmm. been a lot of debate right now of, you know, can you really just go for a shrine right away or does it make more sense to try to push out on the map? with the gaunts with your brutes and try to kill the creeps because with that gaunt ability and fest we know that can allow you to accumulate a lot of additional fiends so there's a lot of different um you know ideas at play here immediately both players are approaching this very differently mm. you've got vortex here going for the speed creeps while on the other hand parting comes down here with a brute split in two setting these fiends out there and trying to get a kill yeah, that actually goes a little bit better for Vortex so far. Parting actually going for a Shroudstone in the center of the map. He's going to go after these resource camps as opposed to the speed camps that have been so popular throughout this tournament. Yeah, so this is this is awesome, man. Very different ideas. I, I would say that what we see Vortex do is generally what you've seen a lot of other streamers and tournament players go for, but this is a very different uh, creep camp set up here for Parting. Like, already taking out the two middle spiders, then taking the spider base out just outside of... Um, his expansion but now we have the push coming in here from vortex and this is a moment Ooh. where you get to do your own scouting he does come in here and force a cancel two brutes are going to come down it looks like the amp could get cornered and it is killed yeah that's that's a great moment right there for vortex so vortex it seems like he's opening up with a little bit of an advantage here he didn't lose an, an imp to that initial brute split uh and look here like he's killed an imp off he's forced to cancel on the expansion he's getting good scouting done it does feel like Vortex has a bit of a lead in this first game. Yeah, Vortex looking pretty strong right now. We've got Parting moving into the middle of the map, and it looks like he's going to try to uh, go in for this vision camp down here in the bottom right. And in fact, Vortex is going in the same direction. Now, when you have these dogfights in the middle of the map, um, you've got to protect your Gaunts. The Fiends can try to jump onto the Gaunts. The Gaunts are very brittle. They're very slow, um, but they're essential when you're going to be creeping on the map because without Infest, you can't accumulate more of those Fiends. And so it looks like that's going to be a pretty big victory for Vortex, getting the Vision Camp and possibly the Speed Camp just to the right of that. It really feels like Vortex has a bit of map control here, right? He's getting his expansion up. That should be up a bit quicker than Partings. He's clearing more camps like you just pointed out. He has more Gaunts on the map. The thing is, Parting is a very creative player. He kind of can look at a position like this and know what he should do to try to come back. And he is sending a lot of fiends across the map, but it looks like as he's, uh, <laughs> as these brutes pop out, he has to pull those back as well. So not really finding any damage. Looks like Vortex will now go to the six o'clock position and take the heal camp out. Nobody has an expansion that's finished yet, but Vortex has at least started his. It does seem like Vortex has a little bit more map control. Um, that shrine's done now. He's got two imps mining from that. Um, and so I, I guess the only thing the party can do, as far as I can tell, is try to play catch up and expand himself. Well, is he going to be able to do that with already a Doombringer coming across the map? 
right? That That's actually a little bit scary right there. If you're dropping out eight gaunts, your opponent better have his gaunts sitting there ready to engage that. So it feels like Vortex continuing to just plow forward in this game, really dictating the pace of it. The big Luminite node at the natural is very close to the cliff's edge. And so we see a lot of drops where they'll try to hit the workers uh, that are mining down there. But in this case, we're gonna see um, the Doombringer just come in here and this is gonna be very dangerous because once you have these imps infested, if, if you can get enough damage off, it does cause a kind of a chain reaction here. It looks like Partying's handling this pretty well. I don't think he's lost an imp just yet. And so this is gonna be a very good hold here for Partying. Yeah, he has enough fiends there. He brings up his own uh, gaunts as well. And of course, it's not even the full eight gaunt in there, right? He's got some of his own fiends. Uh, and not really finding damage as of yet. Looks like Parting gonna load up his own Doombringer, start to send it across the map, but leaves his fiends here to try to defend. That's gonna come back in here now. There is a third base being taken as Vortex is keeping the pressure on here. Um, that Doombringer for Parting is gonna be headed down, but for now we gotta see how many of these workers can actually be picked off. Vortex is doing a good job keeping this position out here. Meanwhile, the drop comes in, but it looks like there should be enough fiends. I think he can actually force us back, and that means Parting is gonna be further and further behind. Well, finally, we have a tower coming down on both sides, so that is a great way to shut this down. And in fact, Parting loses his Doombringer. Vortex going to just barely get out there. So once again, I'm looking at this game. Vortex is taking a third base. He's destroyed the Doombringer. He saved his own Doombringer. It really does seem like he's in control here. Yeah, well, he played a really solid early game, and it just seems like it's very difficult now for Parting to keep up, and especially losing that Doombringer. The Doombringer basically allows you to pin your opponent to their base. Uh, we have another shot that was close. You gotta be careful that it's not normal to have a tower in the middle of the map. It's a very easy way to end up losing a, a weakened Doombringer. But with map control, we're gonna see that um, the Shroud Stone destroyed, the creeping continue to ramp up here for Vortex. And I, mathematically, Artosis, I don't really know how you get out of this position. This looks very unwinnable for Parting right now. Yeah, it looks it looks pretty tricky. Like he just isn't gonna have any map control. Maybe with this new Doombringer, he can he can run Vortex around a little bit. Like that's a, that's a reasonable idea. And of course, I mean, you can tech up further, right? Like maybe he can turtle for a little bit and say, okay, I am a bit behind but maybe we can get into some higher tech, you know, maybe some Hellborns or something to help out against that heavy gaunt composition. You know, what I'm thinking is that the animus that's been accumulated here for Vortex should give him access to that dragon pretty quickly. And it does seem like the dragon is essential as you get into late game, uh, Infernal versus Infernal. You really, um, it, it can be very hard to deal with if one player has it and the other just doesn't because mm -hmm. the fights do become a, a little bit snowball-y. So, uh, let's see if that's in store for us down the road here. Yeah, I know Gaunts shoot up, but if you try to kill the dragon with them, it's <laughs> it's not a fun thing to try. Uh, so we'll see who ends up getting that dragon or if it even does end up coming out this game. But already a Magma Dawn comes out here for Vortex. He's just kind of chasing down the Doombringer, of course, parting, gonna continue to run away. No Twilight Spire out or anything, so doesn't have to worry about this being picked off. Yeah, he sends that, and this is going to be probably the quietest moment of this game. Both sides macroing, both sides developing uh, and teching up here. That very late third base for parting uh, is going to be captured, but you know, Vortex, all he has to do is continue to stay one step ahead. Really, the burden is on parting to try to figure out how to come back in this game. Uh, in RTS, when you do get to, in certain types of games like this one, really, once you've gotten that lead, it's about maintaining that and staying further ahead. And look at that, man. We actually had a very yeah. funny drop there where his Magmadon went down to the side of the map, but he finally does get it out here and will throw that stomp down. So dealing a little bit of damage in here. In the meantime, we have Vortex with a counterattack onto this third base. There are already two Shroud Stones down, though. We've got Magmadons out. These are so strong against the Gaunts and the Fiends. And with a higher Magmadon count here, and Vortex actually hitting in two different locations at once, really forcing Party to try to address and put out all of these different fires. And I don't think this third base can stay up. Well, right now, it looks like Vortex is doing a good job in the main base, but he is kind of running away from Parting's third base location here. As Parting has his own Magmadons coming down, brings his Doombringer as well, unloads those Gaunts, and just going to town with these stomps. Yeah, he's going to be driving him back a little bit further here. 
I think Vortex is being very patient. He does not want to overextend, but this means Parting is still in this game for a little bit longer. A very damaged Doombringer is going to wrap back around here, and I think he's probably going to be merging his main army up and possibly even looking for a push over into the second base. Yeah, it's a possibility. Uh, it looks like he's kind of positioning himself outside of there right now. We do have some more uh, Static D that's gone up here for Parting. Definitely making sure that he's staying very, very safe. Vortex right now rotating back. He is taking a fourth base right now. So that's an important moment. Parting as well, though. It feels like Parting caught up in a lot of ways. Yeah, Parting's done a really good job playing from behind here. We got a really great Magmadon drop. So as you get further on in the game, I know for most of this tournament, we've seen a lot of Gaunt drops, but having one or even two Magmadons really just makes sense because they can wipe the workers out so quickly. So Parting comes in there, gets the damage done, and then gets back out. But we've got a big arm over here for Vortex. Yeah, it looks like he's going to take his vision camp. He does have a bit of map control right now. He's going to be able to get a ton of vision out here, kind of roam back and forth. Obviously, we see that Parting still out there with his Doombringer. Looks like he is going to bring it home now uh, because he might be he might be nervous about this push that's headed towards his third. Yeah, well, he has to hold this push. He has to stay up uh, with, with resources here. And this is a really scary push coming here. He has the Magmadon dive in, a pretty good dodge there uh, from Vortex. Vortex is going to try to advance a little bit further over here. I just don't see a whole lot here to get in the way of these towers. We do have another super powerful tower casted down over here now. And a lot of Magmadons trampling on both sides right now, kind of diving into each other's armies. And of course, the, um, this is doing a good job for Parting because he does have so many Shroud Stones up here dealing that extra damage. So he will end up holding on, but it doesn't feel like Vortex lost too much there, right? He tried the attack, but it wasn't like a huge fumble. Yeah, this has been such good defense from Parting. This whole game has just been deflecting uh, and shutting down everything. Now, that being said, Vortex is continuing to grow, and that's what's important as well. He can... Um, you know, if he doesn't kill off these bases with these attacks, as long as he can still try to play a control game and dominate the map, there's still chances for him there. Uh, we got more creeping on the map, and really, Parting hasn't been able to creep for probably the last five or six minutes, I think. Mm. So there's income coming in over there as well. Did they all... Yeah, that, that that's actually <laughs> kind of interesting that you mentioned that, right? Like, this is something that happens in Stormgate if someone has that map control. And now suddenly hitting that fourth base location and Parting a bit out of position. Doesn't have as many Shroud Stones over here. One dies immediately, another morphing one is going to be taken out as well. But Parting bringing his army as quickly as possible. Okay, we see the Magmadons coming back across over here. Um, it looks like, I can't tell if those units are bugged or they're behind the cliff back there, but mm. there's gonna be a push coming here from Vortex. Vortex has gotta be careful and try to thread this needle. He's 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 gotta make sure he can take out the shrine north of that position we saw there earlier. Um, at the same time, not get pulled into the uh, Shroud Stones that are gonna do so much damage over there. Some great stunning going down here from Vortex as he gets on top of a bunch of these Gaunts. Parting's double uh, Magma Dawn over at that third base of Vortex doing a great job as well. He's actually killed off quite a few units over there while most of the micro is on his side of the map. Okay, he's coming out now in Vortex. It seems like he's overextended pretty badly. Um, Parting is now going to be able to clean up both of these attacks on either side. This is going really rough right now again you know the easiest way when you're ahead in all these bases like vortex was is to just overextend and feed into the opponent we've got the dragon now in with the mix and um yeah. you, you yeah, were talking still... about that dragon before tasteless definitely so important so powerful here with that huge aoe infest getting it down on those gaunts already picking multiples of them off can parting hold on against this yeah, he's got to be careful not to overextend with that dragon. But, you know, especially with Gaunts out on the map, those are very brittle units. That's a great way to start to snowball that damage with those fiends here. He's going to keep pushing. We got one tower that's going to be up, uh, using that ability to infest and then soak that infest back up to gain more white shields on the dragon, making it very, very tanky, especially as the Gaunt numbers go down. I got to say, I do love some of this defense here from Parting. Gets his own dragon out now. It is actually already... Uh, starting to beat Vortex's dragon a little bit here. And Vortex is overrunning. GG is called. And it looks like Vortex hey. is going to take down game number one. That, that was a great game. 
I am really excited. You know, we were talking about how Parting might be uh, the favorite, that he's just going to take it. But I think the reality um, is that Vortex put up a really good fight. He showed deep understanding of how to develop on the map. He got that lead early on, and he kept it. Parting uh, fought back really well. Uh, was able to hang on. I thought the game was going to snowball pretty quickly. Wasn't the case at all, actually. But in the end, Vortex gets that first win in this best of nine. Yeah, that is a big series. That's going to give them a lot of time to learn from each other, right? That's that's something that we got to consider. And looking at that first game, they had very different ideas. We saw Vortex do what we see a lot of Infernal players do, go for that speed camp, really focus on getting out a lot of fiends early on with their infest. Whereas Parting, setting up that tower in the center, taking down the resource camps more quickly, you know, he did kind of fall behind in that early game, but I still found his play promising. It did feel like he fought back to very close to even from there. It's also cool to see how different the creeping patterns were. Um, and look, we're going to have so many games coming in here. So how are they going to learn from each other, adapt, try to you know, maybe even blind counter each other? I don't know. Infernal versus Infernal does seem to come down to who can get more fiends, and a lot of that is really based off of who can uh, dominate the more important camps or who can um, intercept somebody who's about to try to get that important camp. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, there's a lot of really you know fun, crazy things that can happen at the start of those games. Let's also point out that fiends are just so much faster than gaunts. So if you can ever isolate mm -hmm. their gaunts in the map, it does seem like you can start to really quickly snowball a fight. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like the Gaunts, it feels like when units are on the Gaunts, they literally don't beat anything, <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> whether whether that be Lancers, Exos, the Magmadons, Fiends, whatever it is, like the Gaunts do end up falling apart there. So definitely a very important aspect. Can you reduce your opponent's Gaunt count, right? Can Can you get it to a position where you're going to be the one getting a ton of extra Fiends and suddenly they have no map control like we saw there from Parting? Yeah, and um, you know, we again no no super quick expanse. It does seem like right now the current school of thought is you got to get your vault out, you got to get your conclave out. You need to do whatever you can to first uh, start to accumulate the fiends and, and get the uh, resources that you get from killing those creeps. We've had some people fast expanding. I don't know if that's going to change as this best of nine continues on, but that does seem to be the way the game is being approached in Infernal versus Infernal. Yeah, yeah, definitely something that we have uh, seen that we have noticed. And I honestly, I'd love to see something like that. I would love to see one of these guys decide, you know what? Let's go. Let's go with a, a, that shrine first, right? Maybe utilize some of those shroud stones. Make sure you're not dying early on and and just kind of give that catapult to your, your economy and come out stronger in that mid game. But the thing is, you know, as we've seen, you end up getting so many fiends by controlling the map. You end up getting a little bit of extra resources, right, from controlling the map. So you you kind of are okay even if your opponent gets that economic advantage. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I think that map that we just had, that does allow for more of a, a macro, dramatic game, whether it's a mirror matchup or it's, uh, you know, Infernal versus Vanguard. It does seem to be a pretty well-designed uh, uh, one that leads to some pretty uh, pretty epic games here. Now, I don't know what the next map is going to be, uh, but, you know, Jag and Maw has been in the map pool. This is made for some extremely short games. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we've got to see what's going to happen next. <laughs> yeah, I could... I, I mean, when it's Infernal versus Infernal and Jag and Maw, I guess everything's equal and balanced, right? But we've seen a lot yeah, of games yeah. there that feel like they're decided in, like, the first minute because we have the fight at the speed camp, right? And whoever takes that down really gets more fiends and you know ends up having a bit more map control and can clear more camps maybe get that that siege camp more easily uh but i gotta imagine these two are both very creative players they're both very aggressive players great at micro uh very decisive so i feel like that has opened up the possibility that like yeah maybe we see each map three times we might end up seeing like three different strats on each map from them you know, normally when you have an RTS game that's, you know, it, it's more of a finished product, uh, you would never have the same map uh, back to back. But mm -hmm. this is kind of an interesting mini game that we're we're going to see be played here. What happens when you have to go back onto the same map? Like in that first game, we saw Parting made a tower right in the middle. He, he tried to play around uh, farming the speed camp meta. It, it backfired. It didn't work for him. But what are they going to do if they have to play on that map again, which they certainly will?
right? Uh, so yeah. it, it's it's cool to watch these players try to adapt to each other in real time. Absolutely. And it, you do have to wonder. It's like, okay, well, parting your strategy there on Broken Crown didn't end up working. Are you going to counter what Vortex did? Are you going to try? Did you just mess up something that you had planned for your strategy? And maybe if you do that better, you're going to be ahead? Well, we're going to probably eventually figure that out. I would be surprised if we don't see Broken Crown again here tonight. Yeah, the, the standard, um, at least from what I've experienced and seen, and, you know, this game is very new, so we're all still trying to wrap our heads around it, is, is that you're always going to push for that speed camp, go through there into the vision camp, get the kill on that, and then you do a poke, because in a lot of these Infernal versus Infernal builds, it's hard to scout early. Mm -hmm. the, the imps are not actually fast. You know, in StarCraft, we almost always see scouts with workers, overlords too, of course, but... Um, you can't get to your opponent's base very quickly with a worker. And so you're playing a little bit of a blind game to start. So it seems like what many of these players are doing is clearing out those speed camps and then they have enough bulk. They can basically do a poke into the natural. Yeah. Um, yeah. That That's what we've yeah. seen as the standard. But it actually, if you think back to that last game, that was an interesting thing that parting did is he went for a quick brute, split it immediately and just yeah. sent his fiends across the map. You know, he did a little bit of harassment with them, but Honestly, that was heavily a scout as well. He didn't actually end up killing anything, but he did see what Vortex was going for, even though it was kind of what you would expect anyways. But the the, the fundamental problem that comes with that is then you have to make a vault, right? So you're showing your opponent some of your tech, and um, you know, is it perhaps better to have gone and, and played a more of a blind game where you just push the creeps and checked in later? I don't know. These are the ideas. These are the things mm -hmm. we're trying to figure out. We're trying to learn as we unpack this game. Um, but it, it is it's cool to see that they weren't doing the exact same thing. Instead, there's two completely different approaches, and it made for a pretty chaotic early game. Yeah, yeah, it definitely was an interesting one as far as Infernal versus Infernal goes, right? Like they were going down different roads. Obviously, they kind of converged in the overall unit set that they were going for you definitely need to get into those magma dons very very powerful the doom bringers of course that's been like a staple for the last few weeks here uh for infernal and i think we will definitely see more of that but i guess the question is like how fast are we going to see these expansions and everything especially if we get into jagged maw how aggressively do you play that on one base yeah and and you know is it a situation where you want to try to just ambush their push to the the creep camps or do you want to um i don't know try to play in, into counter attacks i mean when you know a player is creeping on the map there should be some fundamental vulnerability inside their main is is that the way to approach it the thing with jagged maw if that's the next map we're going to be on is that the map design the idea that was implemented is so quickly available to the player um that the whole game kind of becomes how do you get that catapult right um but yeah i mean maybe there's ways to play around that or do counterplay with that so so tasteless i'm actually getting information right now you you saw a parting type the question mark in that game right he was it, it i saw that something I, I was of, yeah i messed up my casting for a second when i saw this question mark so yeah go ahead all right so apparently what is happening here is there was a significant bug in that game, which was dropping units outside of the map. Okay, so Vortex basically dropped some gaunts okay. on the low ground between the uh, natural base and the third base. Yeah, and I saw that. so the, the admins have ruled that that is going to be a regame. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I saw the units. I thought I was like a little bit confused happening they looked like there were units that were just kind of stuck um over on, on on like off a cliff or whatever so okay so it's a regame that's that this game yeah, is obviously still in beta yeah. and Go ahead. just to make this clear for people apparently this was in the rule handbook okay that you were not allowed yeah. to do this particular thing so before anyone goes crazy about that uh i mean if it's in the rules it's in the rules so i guess we're gonna have a regame yeah. okay we're starting over um, that's good to know it's in the rule book. This isn't some willy nilly decision. Um, but yeah, I guess that, that is a, uh, disqualifying, uh, or not disqualifying, but it's, it's would force a reset. So we're going to be going back into, I assume the same map broken crown again. Yep. And, um, I mean, this is even crazier now, Artosis. How are they going to open up this time? They just played the game. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's a really good question. Like you kind of know what your opponent had planned there for Broken Crown. Do you try to counter it? I feel like Vortex will probably play very similarly to what we saw, but this is a really big opportunity for parting. He got to see what Vortex was made of, yeah. but Vortex landed his gaunts in the wrong place, so parting gets a rego. Yeah, and so we've got a long uh, match ahead of us here. We're not even into game one, technically. Um, but, you know, with the limited number of maps that are available, I mean, there's going to be so many crazy mind games here. And now we have an extra game inside of the best of nine that's, yeah. that's you know been played out. So there's already been some information revealed there. Um, it's too bad there was that, uh, that bug. Obviously, this game is not finished. Um, there's not even a, a tier three or um each faction yet we only have two of the factions that mm -hmm. have been playable and been shown to the public so um these bugs are going to happen that's too bad it happened in a moment like this but we had rules for it apparently uh if, if it came up and so here we are yeah yeah so uh yeah i think we're just getting the players ready for this and uh we'll get them back into that game uh we already have broken crown kind of queued up for this map once again and, you know, I feel like that uh, that game that we just saw, I guess that's the practice game. The first game of the day doesn't count, right? The first game of the finals doesn't right. count. Uh, <laughs> these guys <laughs> have ideas of what's going on. Uh, obviously, they're go both going to be watching out for that at this point. You know, you have a game that goes like that. you got to be thinking to yourself, I cannot be letting that happen again, right? Like, that has to be very frustrating for Vortex. Sure, yeah. Um, very frustrating, but it's, it's a... Uh... A needle he's going to have to thread here. He's going to be very ca cautious with how he, you know, controls and, and, and maneuvers. Um, there is a very big similarity to a lot of these uh, later games in StarCraft II here in Stormgate now where um, it, it's very much about trying to set, like, multiple fires on the map and try to force the opponent to put them all out or, or mm -hmm. one will, will, you know, will start to burn too big and be too much of a problem and the game can end there. And, and certainly... Whether it's Infernal versus Infernal or it's Infernal versus Vanguard, Gaunt Drops seem to be the way to go. I mean, even when I was practicing before I was watching people's streams, that's kind of organically where I ended up was getting, uh, you know, the Doombringer and loading it mm -hmm. up. I just, you know, you do you do enough creeping on the map um, and cranking out those Gaunts. And then by the time the Doombringer is in play, you go, okay, well, now I got this thing. Let's try to <laughs> uh, go out and, you know, I don't know, see if I can harass some workers. And it also sets up really nicely because once you get a, a couple of infests and hits on those bobs or on those imps, once the fiends start to spawn, all the workers die right away. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's crazily strong. And it's funny to see as well, uh, you know, two infernal players do it against each other. And then you got to also take into consideration, right? Fell hogs, they get turned into fiends. It feels like that might be the best first place you can land because you can't run with those, right? If someone's really on top of it, you land near the imps, the imps get pulled. You're not going to get any kills there. But if you already start getting fiends right off the bat, I feel like that. I I feel like that's something that we might end up seeing here, right? Is you focus. If you see that meat farm, you make sure you get those first few fiends uh, for free and they can really help you snowball the damage everywhere else. It's a funny thing that I feel like I would never really say in a mirror matchup, but it does seem like, infernal has this uh fundamental vulnerability to other infernals when they're being attacked <laughs> because you know the hogs the bases and and, and yeah. the fact that even if you can uh corner a couple of your opponent's gaunts that are infested mm -hmm. right then you can spawn out some more fiends for you so it, it does seem like it's a very delicate interaction that you have and especially Dude, if you can yeah. be an aggressor and do damage Infernal beats Infernal, man. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, no, it, and that's yeah. really funny that you say that because I definitely, I know what you mean here where it's like, yeah. okay, so wait, Infernals are extra good against their opponent's supply buildings, the meat farms? Yeah. Guess what? The same exists with Vanguard, man. Do you know how quick those dogs kill a habitat? I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I couldn't believe it the first time dogs killed a habitat. I'm like, oh my God, that, that dies quicker than a bob almost. So uh, yeah, <laughs> Vanguard's good against Vanguard and Infernal's good against Infernal. It's uh, it's also a funny thing when you're like trying to to pick up an RTS game and you don't have a relationship with each of the units yet. Like it's that, you know, you, <laughs> I'm sure you had many <laughs> games uh, like I did Artos just where I like get into a fight on the map, but I have no idea if I'm going to win, but I know I'm going to learn a lot about the game <laughs> yeah. by the time this fight is done. Sometimes I think it's even and I win or I get mm -hmm. completely dominated. Um, but whenever you're picking up an RTS, that's all that stuff comes over time. And then once yeah. you really 
have an understanding of how each of the units interact with each other and what's strong or weak versus what, then you can have a lot of fun. Absolutely. And uh, honestly, the, that's something that I really like, uh, you know, about Stormgate is it felt like it didn't take very long to kind of get that information and get those relationships with those units and kind of understand what was going on. It felt like it was I, I really honestly, I feel like I played about 10 games and I'm like, I get it. All right. This is awesome. Let's play. Really, it is a uh, very Blizzard esque RTS and that you start out with a couple of very basic uh units and ideas and then it, it it uh pretty quickly fans out into a lot of complexity and a lot of potential um as you know like i remember even just trying to figure out okay so like does my infest overlap with their infest uh if we're hitting you know a creep or yeah to, <laughs> yeah all these different things you have to kind of map out and understand in order to really tackle an rts um so already i mean we're off to a very exciting store uh start here with stormgate yeah yeah and uh, definitely looking forward to getting this series started once again. Feels kind of funny starting at zero. It almost feels like when you get a draw, right? Draws being just such a rare yeah. thing within RTS games. But I am kind of getting that feeling. I'm like, hey, we get an extra game here tonight. Isn't that nice? I'll take that. I'll take some high level uh, Stormgate games and even an extra oh, one on top of the best of nine. I got, I got some new information here, Tasteless. Okay. All right. So apparently... Uh, they have re-watched the replay, and it seems that the it, this was not intentionally done by Vortex, and Vortex was already ahead, so they're going to go ahead and call this a 1-0 to zero victory for Vortex. We're going back to what we had before. Okay. <laughs> Vortex is won, and uh, yeah, we'll see if that, uh, if that changes again at all, but I think we're going to be going into a new map now. Okay, well, forget all that stuff we said earlier. We're going to go into game two. Um, yeah, I guess that makes sense. If if the game was not decided off that bug, then that's the, the route they're going to go for. Um, so we're going to be going into game two. That means that we, just to update everybody here, we are now in a best of nine in the grand finals here in EGC. Um, and Vortex is in the lead here. We got many, many, many more games to go. We're on the map. Jag and Ma, we've got Parting in the top right and Vortex in the bottom right. All right, all right. So Jag and Ma is going to be our map. And, you know, this is what I was kind of most wondering about is what the match between these two will look like here. Like, are they going to go absolutely ham after the speed camp? Do you just build something near the resource camp? Are we going to see uh, quick rushes to try to get the catapults, right? There's a lot of different options on how you could play this. All of them kind of aggressive. Certainly. Um, I'm glad that they are willing to try maps out like this. I know that this map has uh, been somewhat controversial for Stormgate. But, you? but the, the reality <laughs> is, is that there's just so many things you can do with an RTS, right? And so why not give this a try? Or, or maybe this idea leads to another cool idea. So immediately we're gonna see uh, a shroud stone placed nearby the siege camp there on the bottom. Now, most of the games on this map have the same idea, but there's different types of executions of that idea. It's it's how do you get ideally both, but even just one of the siege camps and can you snowball the fight? And this is also a map that it just seems, and look, maybe we're gonna learn more about this map later on, but right now it seems fundamentally uh, very difficult and if you were to fast expand it would seem almost irrational because you'd be playing mm. into their push Absolutely. right so something to point out there i i have to mention that this is the second game in a row now that we're seeing parting approach this in a different way than a lot of the other infernal players we've seen right most infernal players have been clearing other camps first and going to this later and he's just saying screw it he literally started with his first gaunt <laughs> while he was still making his shroud stone whereas you see over here the more standard play from vortex he's like okay we get a gaunt out we start taking these other camps building up fiends and he's definitely getting a lot of fiends here yeah he's got a lot of fiends those are going to be beelining over into the uh the base keep in mind you don't really have a whole lot of defense the fiends very good against gaunts can he isolate these gaunts Notice the positioning, by the way, guys, of the buildings inside the main for parting. He has one conclave slightly higher than the other. Uh, he, you're able to make a, a small little hallway that you can, or like an alley that you can squeeze your gaunts in, which makes it harder to surround them with fiends. Mm. Definitely SimCity being something super important in all RTS games. You gotta place those buildings correctly, utilize them 
to your advantage, big part of the strategy. And now uh, it looks like, you know, Parting has that, that first catapult and, well, I guess he's he's going to go for it. But uh, yeah, I mean, he's he's clearing out these camps and everything. He didn't mine out or uh, break out through the center, which we've seen for most of the catapult pushes. So it will take a little bit for this to go around the map. Yeah, I was, you know, I'm glad you pointed that out. I was I was noticing that it's, it's going to be taking the long trip to get over there. A lot of the builds we've seen here have been uh, engineered to kill the catapult and then open up the center so that the catapult can get there quickly. But mm -hmm. Pardon has a different approach in that he's letting it go the long way and that way he can creep up even more. And that means more fiends. Yeah, that's interesting. Like he gets that, that health camp, uh, you know, he got the, the close by resource camp as well. Obviously those two middle camps of speed and the vision camp were cleared here by Vortex earlier on. But here we go. He's he's going to start going for it. There is his catapult. He starts to move forward. But it... Oh, my God. He actually brings in a Doombringer to pick everything up while he loses the catapult. Was... Tasteless, was that good, you think? Like, this, I don't this understand. feels weird. I don't know what that means. It's like... Um... Yeah, it seemed like it was almost like a, a, a timed out so that he could just get there and throw a few attacks before escaping, <laughs> leaving the catapult yeah. to die. So kind of a weird interaction. Um, now the center of the map is opened up. Vortex is pushing through here. And I think that honestly, Parting should just bail entirely on this position. But yeah, this like no, this, he no longer this has... Doesn't, this right. doesn't feel like super, super great. Now he is microing really well picking off like he's going around where the brutes are and picking off gaunt so that's good but it doesn't feel like he actually gained all that much here you know maybe the idea is really that he's less focused on actually winning the game with that um mm. th that catapult and more just kind of getting those creeps out of the way so he can get a base up do you see what i'm saying yeah well he does get his base up super super fast this game and that's that's huge right like here he is he's he's got a decent sized army he's got his uh doombringer out already look at this he's flanking the other siege camp i guess this worked out actually quite well for parting it looked really weird and made me question Whoa. strategically what he was doing but that's it gg parting gonna take that, that game incredibly quickly and like i honestly did not expect that because like we've seen so many people win with that siege camp yeah. And that just wasn't what he was going for. Like, he made the siege camp, just saved his stuff. That bought time. Like, Vortex saw it coming, so he just made a ton of units, right? He made extra brutes that you don't necessarily want. And you know what Parting's spending his money on? A new base. Okay, so, yeah, I, I think what actually is happening there is, is he's taking control of the siege camp first, and then he ditches it. Yeah. So we were kind of talking about and complaining about this map, honestly. But th the fact that a... Doombringer comes in there and scoops up the gaunts and leaves and the catapult dies. Yeah. Now I'm almost seeing this as some kind of level of brilliance. Yes. Because by the time yeah. by the time he had pushed, and he never opened up the middle, right? He forced uh Vortex to open up um the middle. Mm -hmm. And so Vortex, when he finally does that, he pushes. There's already like two or three shroud stones there to defend. So um yeah, I mean, very interesting game there. Dude, like, honestly, so many things that, that I, I was thinking of there, like, I was wondering, why doesn't he kill the vision camp, right? And conceal what he's doing, that this is coming around. But, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that was purposeful to get Vortex to spend money, to get Vortex to sit home and make all these units that aren't going to be worthwhile while he expands, rebuilds his army out, and then comes across the map with a strong mid game. Um, We've got our host here with us. Well, uh, Killer Pigeon, what are you thinking about what you just saw back there? I think my brain is wrinkling right now. Parting is uh, a magical <laughs> man, boys. I, I think that was actually, that was genius, right? Like you were just highlighting the fact that he clearly set it up as a bait. It's an interesting kind of um, flip narrative as well, right? Because I think something we, we talked about at the beginning of this series is this idea that being base ahead, right? Being more focused on your your uh, mid-game transition, getting the eco up seemed to be a big edge in the IVI matchups. Map control almost feels like it's a little bit more baiting, especially ever since they nerfed the speed camp from five creeps to three. And I think that's quite appropriate because in that first game, uh, which may have seemed like a while ago for some people now, it was a, a bit of time ago, that game was once again dictated by this idea of pacing, right? Like Vortex at every stage in that game was one base ahead. And the, the interesting thing there, Artosis, mm. is that 
even though we did have some some low ground shenanigans, um, obviously, you know, it, it happened at a stage so deep in that we had to declare it as a Vortex win, right? Like, it was very obvious he was ahead there. I think the interesting thing is that what we've seen here is an alteration in the way that parting opens. But for me, Vortex's opener on Broken Crown is the same one he's been doing against everyone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think he has a certain way he wants to play it, and he's very good at playing it like that, right? He's very good at micro. He's very good at being decisive and thinking on his feet. So if another player is doing a similar strategy, which a lot of them are, uh, a lot of times I think he can either control or think his way out of it. But the way that Parting is approaching this from a completely different angle, like, yes, Vortex won game one, but, like, that last game, Vortex must be scratching his head, right? Yeah, I, well, we've seen so many things on Jagged Moor, but that was just completely breaking the mold of expectations. I think that's an interesting thing to think about now, Tasteless. Obviously, we've only just got a little bit of a, a taster of this series, only two games in. But, you know, when you go in these longer series, best of sevens, best of nines, it's not about who has the best, like, build order for that one punch, that two punch. You need to be very flexible, I want to say. And my concern is, like, based on these opening games, do we think that Parting maybe has a lot more strategies we've yet to see here? It, it, that's a really good point. I, I think Parting is showing that he has a lot of range in play. Um, and, like, I don't look, I don't know what's better when the you're in a brand new RTS game. In my head, I, I feel like you should have, like, one really good way to approach, you know, each map and just, like, do that better than everybody else. But... Um, it may be like a variety of builds and a, and a bunch of uh, I, different ideas being executed back to back in each game uh, that is going to win uh, this forum. And again, as this best of nine continues to unpack itself, it's going to be really fascinating to see who sticks with the same build orders or strats and, and who really deviates. Because it does seem like we're starting to see maybe Vortex uh, more repetitive and more mechanical and parting um, a little bit more intuitive. One thing that I think is fair to say, Artosis, is that once Vortex gets that machine rolling, he seems to have this very good formula, right? It's all about mm -hmm. the animus escalation. We saw the dragon in game one. And, you know, one thing that I was thinking sitting there, you know, we often talk about Hornets being a good solution, maybe some flat cannons and exos to solve the problem. One crazy thing to think about in this mirror matchup is you don't have a, a great fast solution because mm. why would you be building a Twilight Spire <laughs> in a mirror? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it it doesn't do a lot for you. Uh, you know, I, I, I remember the first when I was first starting to play Infernals, I made a bunch of Spriggans, man. Boy, did I find out they don't do much in that matchup. Uh <laughs> so yeah, I don't I don't expect anyone to go for that. But obviously, like say you pop out a couple of Shadow Flyers and and pop the Doombringer when it's it's full of units, like that was probably worthwhile, right? Mm. Yeah, no, that, that's a fair way of looking at it, right? We expect the Doombringer. That's always coming on both sides. And we're seeing how clutch the difference can be there. Um, but boys, we just got confirmation on our third map. We are going back to Broken Crown. This could be good for Vortex. Parting is adjusted. We've seen him look good as he shifts deep in the series. The question as we get ready for this game is whether Parting has something new for us or if Vortex is going to copy and paste that game one. Let's get to it. All right, we're going to be going into um, our game right now. And I'm very happy to say we are one and one. Uh, so we got ourselves a series, Artosis. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I expected this from the beginning. Like, even if Parting does end up winning, as I, I think he will, Vortex for sure good enough to take multiple games here. But this is the big test. Does Parting do the same thing and adjust? Does he do something completely new? We're about to find out. All right, we've got Vortex here in the top right in the in the red, and in the bottom left in the blue is Parting. So um, it is going, if you remember the first game here, it is going to be uh, the roles reversed here, the positions reversed. So Parting's going to be down here in the bottom. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I, I I do wonder, like, it, it looks like he's, he's leaning towards maybe going through those trees, uh, which we've seen a lot. Uh, is there any chance he wants to go Shroudstone in the center again? Uh, you know, that was that was kind of an interesting play to see so early on. And I do like, you know, you gain those extra resources and everything. Maybe you have a little bit of map control through that center, but it didn't seem so impactful. So, yeah, it looks like he's going towards the mo more standard strategy of going towards the, the speed camp right away that we've seen so much in Infernal vs. Infernal. So just for the beginner players, I want to clarify, because this can look kind of weird. 
they can get out of their base without destroying the trees, but if you tear these trees down, you get a direct, like a beeline over to where the speed camps are. And so that's why you see all these players opening up the back of their base. Because I think for a lot of people, you'd think, why would you want two entrances to your natural expansion? That seems dangerous. But it's really because getting these creeps is so important. And we're still fleshing out the ideas of which creeps you get first. Interestingly, hmm. parting goes for the spider. Most players uh, that I've seen and studied, and myself included, go for the speed camp always immediately. Yeah, like yeah. From, uh, from Vortex. Pretty much everyone has, but let's say for a moment, just theoretically, you know your opponent's going for the speed camp over there. You could grab the resource camp to speed up your production a bit, right? Because it's going to give you that extra money very, very quickly and then deal with the speed camp afterwards. So, you know, in a way, I kind of like the, uh, the adjustment. Yeah, it's cool to see. Um, and I guess, you know, who knows, as, as new maps come out and the creeps change and everything, there's always going to be these uh, things that have to be taken into account. Because getting those creeps and getting the, the, the benefits they give you, uh, whether it's vision or, or the income, or in this case, in, with Infernals, the fiends you get from it are huge. Really well timed that attack, by the way. Mm -hmm. Forced to cancel over there on the shrine. Meanwhile, the exact same mirrored thing is happening over here for Vortex. Yeah, and that's actually a bit painful. Uh, there are more fiends for parting, and he actually is bringing in a couple gaunts as well. So the four fiends that counterattacked by Vortex not actually doing that much, whereas, yeah, this feels a bit better here from parting, doesn't it? Like, he, he brings them up. I guess he doesn't end up getting as much damage as I thought he might there, as we do have a quick turnaround here with the fiends from Vortex. One problem that I see, but I should problem probably is not the right word, one feature of the matchup you got to watch out for is that the gaunts are so slow that if there are fiends on the map they can never run back home mm. you so know, especially you, you considering know. those fiends are have gotten even a speed up on the last batch right like they are very right. speedy right now there's not like a like you can micro the gaunts a little bit but they don't have a lot of health they do fall quickly and so the fiends are just going to be coming up here now. He's, and this is what I'm talking about. You really see the punish there. And, and it just chains out more and more of these fiends. It's really only the brutes that have the muscle, the power to kind of stay and force you to abandon a position. But the thing about the brutes is they're just not fast at all. Gaunts and fiends can run away, no problem. And you can even see here, the gaunts can actually, in higher numbers, kite the brutes. And the brutes <laughs> being so slow, they can't run back home, Artosis. No, <laughs> they're having a bit of a hard time there. So uh, parting does turn and it really feels like parting has the advantage here. He does have a few more gaunts, about three more that are fighting against each other. But Vortex trying to chain a couple kills here and it looks like he will, which does turn this towards his advantage now. Yeah, I mean, that's the crazy thing. This is such a funny matchup with how this works. Yeah. So more fiends are coming out. And as he continues to infest this, he can just keep chaining these uh, these attacks in here. It's going to happen on the fell hogs in a second. The fell hogs have very low HP. Can he get one more fiend to come out there? And now with no fiends over here, we're going to see the reversal of this. He's going <laughs> to chase him back. I love it, too. The brutes being made and turned immediately into those fiends. And look at that. He clears them. And suddenly he's the one with a bunch of fiends on the map. Uh, just it, it is wild to watch this early game of this matchup. And in fact, did he just kill his own his own uh, gaunt there? Oh, I did not see. I'm sorry. Um, I, believe, I, was looking at, I believe Parting just killed his own gaunt there. I think maybe because it was so low on health, he doesn't want it to just instantly oh, that, become a fiend. That would make sense. Yeah, that would make mm. sense. It's probably better to just get rid of damage gaunts so that you don't have that, um, you know, that snowballing effect of, of the yeah. fiends coming out and, and maybe swinging a fight. And look at this. He pushes right up over here to where the Felharks are. He knows exactly where to do, where to, uh, where to go and where to strike. By the way, there is no shrine back at home for Vortex. So Vortex is kind of all in here. He needs, yeah. he needs to really make this damage work. And it seems like he's starting to do it. Yeah, he's doing a good job. Surrounds that brute, gets his fiends absolutely all over the place. They do start to attack into the gaunts here of parting. Obviously, your imps are going to have a very hard time fighting this as well because they're just going to turn on you very quickly like a zombie movie. Uh, going after this meat farm, he's just dealing damage absolutely anywhere that he can. Going after the iron vault, a lot of damage being dealt. Yeah, you know, I feel like if you can get rid of the Iron Vault, you can probably win in a lot of these positions because the only thing that has the muscle to kind of fight off these fiends is a brute. But um, there's a tower that's set up that's covering this. And so he's going to try to stay on the exterior. 
Yeah, you see him attacking his own shrine. That's on purpose because the um, uh, the infest bounced. I don't know what the, I want to call it. Mutilus glaives. I don't know what, it's, what it's, the word to use. Yeah, here. no, it's glaives in my head as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's, the gaunt glaives. Have that bounce off his own building, and that'll connect to an enemy unit here. Yeah, uh, it I, seems I, I, like. Go ahead. I was just gonna say I don't know how they carry that many sides, man. The amount of sides I see these guys throw. Yeah, that's a good point. They don't, they don't seem to have backpacks or fanny packs <laughs> or anything. Um, another attack's gonna come in here. It seems like parting has stabilized. Now, I don't know how many workers were killed. This is something we're gonna have to check on in a second here. This has been a very chaotic game. And again, we're seeing that fundamental feature of the matchup where the Gaunts can't actually get away. So there's five there, there's 11 there on the Luminite. We have long distance mining happening. Um, because otherwise the main Luminite base would be super saturated for Vortex. So Vortex is about to have his next base kick in and instead he GG's. That's going to be it. Game three goes to parting. All right. All right. Wow. So, uh, yeah, parting definitely having slightly better engagements there. A lot of uh, units lost for uh, for Vortex. Kind of a kind of a tough one, right? Like parting is adjusting. He's changing how he's playing. He's still not playing exactly how Vortex is playing. He's making a few a few little changes right like he dived in with more units early on into vortex's base he also took that resource camp first so definitely has some different optimizations than what we're seeing out of vortex here i guess the question is will vortex start to react to the way that parting is playing this series a good question it, it really seemed like vortex almost just won that like when he got in there where the workers were like as we we, we yeah. had this this like chase scene that was going across the map, and Parting was beginning to lose one gaunt, and then another gaunt, and then another mm -hmm. gaunt after that, and then you could see Vortex knew you don't stay and fight the natural expansion. That's what I would do. I think that's what a lot of players would do. You start <laughs> to try to kill. No, you go for the fell hogs. You go for the imps. You get in there, you get those kills, and suddenly you have enough fiends that you might be able to take the game. Mm -hmm. But behind that, he didn't have his own base. And so I think once the con uh, the um, uh, vault was protected by the tower and he was able to mine um, with his imps again and, and, and eradicate the presence of Vortex in his base, it just looked like it wasn't enough. So Vortex yeah, out. yeah, Vortex, he stayed in the game just slightly longer. I think he was probably taking an assessment of exactly where he was at, but unfortunately feeling like he didn't really have any chance there maybe saving a little bit of his energy as well. It is possibly going to be a very, very long series, this best of nine, but parting right now does lead two to one. Yeah, he has managed to take the lead. We've had very different games here. I, I love to see it. I mean, it's showing that the matchup can be really dynamic. We had a pretty dramatic late game uh, in game one. We had a game I think we're all still kind of unpacking on Jagged Maw because it was so counterintuitive to what we had seen a prior, which was a pretty repetitive one-dimensional uh, game that would occur over and over on Jagged Maw, instead of pretty deceptive uh, pull there from parting. And then it was just parting with clutch micro, clutch control. I like that you pointed out, Artosis, that uh, parting even killed his own gaunt that was injured mm. just to make sure he had stability and defense. Um, I don't know, man. I'm loving this. This has been a great final so far. Yeah, yeah. It actually, it, it's it's delivering more than I even thought it would, honestly, with the variety of strategies that we are seeing so far. And we're only three games in. Uh, I think it's going to continue to get better and better. It looks like our next map is going to be Secluded Grove. So going to be our first time here in the finals, and we'll see how these guys play this map a bit differently. This is a map where the center is extremely powerful economically, and it seems like a lot of games kind of come down to who can actually capture that. And usually after it's captured, the game ends pretty quickly because it's uh, not feasible financially to recover no matter how you do it. Uh, in this game, game four, we've got Parting in the top right and Vortex in the bottom left. All right. Uh, we'll see what they want to end up opening up here with. Looks like we are going to get those iron vaults down very, very quickly. But yeah, are they going to go very heavy on the camps? Which camps are they going to end up being? Uh, and is it possible that we get a big macro game here? I really, I do want to see some later game between these two where no one's really ahead, right? Yeah, it, it does seem that uh, Infernal versus Infernal is so much about um, trying to get a lead early though. You know what I mean? You, you, mm -hmm. you have the Achilles heel. The strongest thing about the the faction and the achilles heel on the map at the same time 
So the strongest thing that they have is the infest, right? That seems to be what the mm -hmm. whole faction is built around. But at the same time, the Gaunt uh, is a great target. The, the Gaunt, the thing that it creates the infest and the fiend ultimately is also the great target for your opponent to do the same thing. So it's kind mm -hmm. of a crazy way that it develops. Well, right now, uh, it looks like parting, you know, going through that camp area with the speed camp, with that resource camp, but an immediate brute popped into a couple fiends here from Vortex. He's running around and it looks like he wants to go and check if that's what's going on. In fact, he's going to get right through there with his fiends. And he's going to say, okay, you've already, you've already cut a hole through here. So maybe he tries for like some sort of ambush play here against parting. Yeah. Those trees, a lot of players have started to open those up really, really early on. So that's kind of cool to see him scout for that. And maybe he's going to be able to set something up that would be pretty cool. Vortex right now is kiting these um, goats, these creeps over here. The same thing is happening for parting just up at 12 o'clock. Um, I don't know if there's going to be trees carved out over there or not. But uh, other than that, I got to point out, parting is taking um, a, a second base. And there is no second base yet for Vortex. Yeah. Which means Vortex that... is going to be pressed to do something very soon. And I don't even know that he can do anything, Artosis. You know, the funny thing is when he brought his fiend over to scout, if Parting had opened up that area, he didn't actually scout all the way to the expansion. He just did that now, if I'm not mistaken, right? Oh, is that so right? It's almost as if Parting opened that. Maybe he saw that Vortex likes to scout that early. He opens that, which points towards himself doing a lot of creeping in the early game and then he just yeah. expands because then vortex dude. is like he, vortex is thinking the complete oh. wrong thing here dude i think you're right yeah because yeah when you see the tree open up you go oh he's gonna creep he's gonna creep through the bottom and he, and he could see that he, he was ready to set that up but then he, he didn't do anything there i guess he's gonna yeah. hit this right now but uh this is a fast expand build with delayed creeping and yeah. so this is one of these moments where like you make a couple moves on the map uh, and, and you get your opponent to behave a certain way, and now you're two steps ahead. Yeah, this, it, it, like, I'm I'm in shock, like, how many mind games that Parting seems to be pulling off here. Uh, it's it's kind of crazy. And in fact, look at this. Like, he goes up, he's removing so many camps now, he has that economic advantage. Vortex is trying to make something happen here, right? Like, he's running around, he's still doing his creeping, uh, and he is getting an expansion, but it just feels like Everything is a little bit smaller for him. Everything is a little bit later for him. Yeah. And um, look, I, I want to be clear to everybody because that, that play from Parting is, is crazy. And, and I'm so excited to see it. But this is not a, a losing position here for Vortex. Like, Vortex is behind. But I, there's still a lot of potential for what can happen next in this game. It does seem like both sides have enough distance just due to the, the geography of the map that they can... Um, creep and pretty much go untouched uh by the way here comes that doom bringer out and, and by the <laughs> way parting has answered a question for me that i've been trying to figure out forever should i get my third shrine where the ore is or where the uh third luminite is and apparently hmm. he goes for the ore hmm. yeah that is that is kind of interesting right like he doesn't want that super long distance mining i guess but here we go he's gonna go ahead and unload going after the imps on this theorem immediately a lot of damage put down and in fact going to start getting uh a few kills here yeah parting oh my god that was a quick gg there yeah. i guess the reality of of having the additional uh base up early the fact mm -hmm. that he's able to get the Doombringer out and across the map and just start to kill a couple of workers. This is forces Vortex to pass, uh, to, to tap out. I almost said pass out. He's not passed out. He yeah. taps out. He will be awake for the next game. Hopefully. But, hopefully. Um, but man, Parting is really good at these really complicated maneuvers uh, early on to kind of get himself into a position that's better. And um, I, it seems like that, that gaunt drop there at the end was the... The nail in the coffin vortex taps out yeah well i mean at that point how far behind are you truly like he doesn't have his expansion up in mining yet and he's already losing imps in his main he has no real mobility compared to parting he has less macro compared to parting there's nothing nothing truly left at that point uh the thing that's really getting to me here taste is we're seeing two different games dragon Maw now here on uh, secluded grove where it seems as if parting has set up an unbelievable mind game like he knows Vortex yeah. inside and out, and he's just completely dominating mentally.
yeah, I mean, it, it's wild. This game is so new. It's not even done yet, but the, the stuff we're seeing is so advanced here mm -hmm. uh, from Parting. He's really put the prep in. Again, my, the fact that Vortex is smart enough to check the tree, that the tree's been removed. Yeah. And that Parting is smart enough to know that Vortex would check that. <laughs> and so basically put like a red herring out strategically um, and then just go for a quick expand. I mean, this is <laughs> stuff I thought we would be talking about like years from now in the yeah. game, but it's already, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's true. Like I remember when Starcraft two came out, we were talking about all these ideas. Like, do you think we'll ever see this? Do you think we'll ever see this? And a lot of it did take years to get to Yeah. And here. It's like, yeah. okay, well, parting is, is playing 4d chess already here in the first beta <laughs> that we have for Stormgate. There's not even like tier three units or three races yet, but Parting has figured out your brain and he's playing with it right now. Yeah, uh, it's wild. So our score now is three to one. Yeah. Now, this is a best of nine. I think this is the first best of nine we've ever casted our toes, by the way. I don't, I, I would imagine not. I would imagine cast so. it for so long, like, but I best I of nine is, is a big I, series. I can't think of one other one other one we did, but uh, we're starting to get a very big disparity here. Mm -hmm. Three to one is is where it starts to get pretty bad. Party needs two more wins to close us out, and Vortex needs four. So I think Ooh. this next game in this series, for Vortex's sake, but even for Party's sake too, probably the most pivotal one. Yeah. I, well, I think if, it's you down, if you go down, if you go down four one, if you go down four yeah. one, like at that point, I want to see Parting pick Vanguard till he wins. You know, like <laughs> you're just so far behind at that point. Uh, so I think Vortex is aware of that. You know, I, I I'm sure a lot of people are looking at this saying, ah, Vortex is GGing too fast. Honestly, probably not the case. I think that he's looking at the games. He knows he's lost. He knows the level of him and his opponent. But you don't want to torture yourself staying in a lost game, right? Keep your, your energy up. Don't be thinking too negatively. It's like, okay, yeah, he got me there. Okay, let's go to the next game, right? I like yeah, the yeah. fact that he's bowing out when he knows it's done. The stamina is essential. Best of nine is a lot of games. You need to be in the zone, keep your energy levels going. And look, the third shrine had started for partying, so he was going to get the ore kicking in. Um, you get the money for the fourth shrine pretty quickly, anyways in, in the way that game was developing the fact that it was vortex just now getting his second base with income flowing in and already parting hits the drop it was definitely over yeah definitely over but, but by the way four different games um already none yeah. of these games are looking like the other no absolutely not i mean they may as well be playing uh different factions at this point uh all right so we're gonna go to the map draft take a look here it's going to be broken crown once again third time that we're gonna be seeing this map in five games and you know i kind of like this constant repeating of the maps because we you know we remember game one we remember game three okay what is vortex going to do differently what is parting going to do differently here going into the fifth game all right, guys, let's hop into that game right now. It is going to be Vortex in the... I'm sorry, it's going to be Parting here in the bottom left in the blue and Vortex in the top right in the red. Um, so, will we have the Conclave and the Vault thrown down? I'm guessing yes. It doesn't seem like anybody wants to go for um, you know, the Shrine right away. I think the Speed Camps are just too enticing. Um, remember that we did have very different... Uh, very different navigation of the map from parting uh, in, in, in both the games. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, I, can we have another very different game here in game three? I say, why not? Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely a, a possibility, I would say, right? Like I could see parting doing something completely different. I don't know about Vortex though, right? Like. I'm I'm not sure what you do as Vortex, but I am sure you do need to change it up because it's clear that Parting has looked at his games. He's kind of figured out some patterns and maybe the way that Vortex is likely to react. And he's utilizing that to his own benefit. So I feel like Vortex, if there is a time to turn what you're doing upside down and do something new, something fresh, it's now. For now, we've got the... Um... 
I guess we could call standard play uh, happening on this map from Vortex again. It's going to be a push to the speed camp. I, I'm curious about the rationale for why Harding does the spider camp first. Oh, I see. Why? Hold on. Does he scout? Oh, okay. Right, well, I think I have some insight into why Parting does that. Okay. He uses that fiend to check the high ground because there's some plays, and me personally, oh. I've been doing this a lot, is you, is you try to attack them as they're hitting their camp. Yeah. Right? Yeah, no, that, make, so that makes sense. We've definitely seen that. Yeah. yeah. And so when, when he plays like this, what he does is the fiend goes up onto the high ground, peaks, and that way, if you find out that, like, there's an attack coming from that side. You just run back and play defensive. Mm -hmm. Really, oh, that, that makes stuff. that makes great sense. Yeah, and don't forget. I mean, you get that little bit of bonus uh, money right away as well. So that might help yeah, you to yeah. just afford like who knows an extra imp or something right off the right off the bat. So I like it. And here is that attack that we've seen each and every time. Forces a cancel on that shrine, gets the kill as well. Meanwhile, Vortex is not counterattacking. Instead, he's clearing the center. So. That seems to be timed out literally to just cancel that building. Mm -hmm. I guess there's, you know, inside Parting's mind, he knows, okay, the, you're going to be on the map at some point in time. I have enough fiends. I can basically run and attack that and run back out. And then he can snake back across the map. He never brought brutes, right? He just has uh, gaunts and fiends. He can get brutes now if he wants. Then he's going to be up a base. His base will finish first. And he can hold off at an attack, I think, from Vortex. <laughs> Yeah, I don't I don't think Vortex can just go in and break him right now. Looks like he's going to clear the health camp. Maybe, like, I, I don't think it's just for the Fiend. I think maybe he wants to heal a bit. No, I guess not. He's just going to run away from that. So not really able to put any any counter pressure on. Man, I got to say, this feels, it feels better for parting. If you're canceling your opponent's base and getting yours up on time, that's just a, you know, that's an advantage. Yeah, it really is. Um, well... We see another game where like Hardy just kind of inches out ahead. By the way, I'm, I'm very fascinated by the placement of the Shroud Stone. I guess that mm -hmm. doesn't slow down workers, or is it just because that's I the only it... way to cover all the workers and, and <laughs> yeah. not uh, not have to make two Shroud Stones? Yeah, I think it's I think it's the the least intrusive for having one Shroud Stone defensively. It, like yeah. if you put it on the side, you can't you can't quite defend everything really well. So yeah, I think it's just like it's a it's a pretty smart play. So we have the, uh, is, sorry, is this, this is called a, it's a Doombringer, right? I That's almost, right. For some reason, I keep, keep thinking it's called a Doomsayer. Sorry, Doombringer <laughs> comes out. Four gaunt um, drop. There is a Doombringer coming across the map um, for Vortex as well. Let's see if we can get any damage done with that. But again, it just kind of shows you parting is, is just, you know, about 15 seconds ahead with everything mm -hmm. that he's done. And, and is very good at continuing to... to elongate that lead as much as possible yeah having that that your doombringer over there more quickly right like look at this and he is going for that that kind of strategy we were talking about earlier like he's picking off some fell hogs getting those those additional fiends out really quickly in the meantime back at home he leaves his fiends there to very quickly react to vortex's doombringer and it just it like parting is getting more done with this drop harassment okay so he's gonna back out this is just like it's a moment it kind of reminds me of a starcraft one pvp where they're both reaver dropping each other right now this is just a phase <laughs> of the game where they both yeah. have to defend he does keep the shroud stone alive that's really good because if you lose the shroud stone at either of those bases it becomes a lot more easy for the mm -hmm. other player to snipe your imps yeah and you know it is very low so maybe uh vortex will dive in again and try to get it later looks like parting trying to hit from that low ground not going to be able to do it Obviously, Vortex rotating around his gaunts, his, his fiends, his brutes, making sure that no real damage will be dealt. Uh, and, you know, I, I think from here, they both blocked it well enough that we can probably go into the next portion of this game, right? Like the third base, maybe get into some Magma Dons. I, I think we're just about ready for that. Seems like it. Seems like we're going to have another pretty developed game here. Can he actually pick this thing off? I don't believe the Gaunt can throw up into that corner. I think you can keep the, the oh, oh, is he going to get deny on this? Oh, dude, that dude, would be sick. Dude, he's so good at this. How does he know yeah. that he only needs three? He actually probably should have had more there. 
Yeah, if he had sent all of them, I actually think he would have been able to force the cancel. <laughs> but actually, only like three went. Who knows? Maybe that was an accident with like an all army hotkey type thing, right? Like he just mm. space bar attacked somewhere else, and three of them were close enough to aggro or something. Who knows? But uh, doesn't get the cancel, but at least sees that Vortex is taking that third. Yeah, and they're both going to be fairly even on that third base. We're going to be developing into. Um, I guess mid game here. I mean, we don't really know how long each matchup's supposed to go. Or, you know, in RTS, especially like Blizzard ask RTSs, um, like what Stormgate was modeled to be. You know, some matchups are very long, other matchups are short. Mm -hmm. So we don't really know if this is, you know, this is one of the fun things for me personally, learning and casting this game is like, okay, so what what is this matchup going to look like after we have hundreds of games you know casting? yeah yeah who knows maybe someone figures it out and it's like no actually a, the fiends have nothing to do with it right it turns into just magma dons or maybe the fiends are everything and people figure out fiend builds that you know you just overrun your opponent right away it's really hard to say but you know these two i think have a a pretty good feel for what they're doing right now both getting their third bases up some similar oh. harassment from both sides doesn't look like anyone's able to bring down their opponent's Doombringer, so no gigantic advantage as of yet. Oh, what? Look at this. <laughs> this is wild. Oh, you know, I man. Didn't realize there were, I didn't realize there were Magmadons in there until that moment, but that's kind of a clever play to try to dive onto the Gaunts. This will get cleaned up. Did He he got the uh, Doombringer, right? So, so then, yeah, he, the, there's no more drops there. So Vortex is in, in pretty good control this game. Meanwhile, we have a pretty tiny push coming up here honestly yeah I, I, that that doesn't use the party so big. doing it well yeah he, he does go ahead and infest that area sends forward his magma i tell you those magma stomping next to gaunts is so so strong that one will get stuck and parting gonna end up losing one of those important units and will have to pull back and suddenly i feel like this went from a game where i felt like parting was winning for most of it to vortex picking up a few magma kills and maybe having an advantage now. Yeah, that just didn't make a whole lot of sense coming from party. I think especially when the drop got cornered, uh, you know that you're gonna be in bad shape. I think had, had that drop gotten inside like the third or the main, that would be much better. Um, and then you could maybe push up like that. But I think that that push from that point on was kind of an afterthought. Um, so Vortex looking pretty healthy. And again, this is a really important game here. He needs to try to catch up and get his second win. Otherwise, Parting's going to be ahead 4-1, to one, which is a crazy distance here in this best of yeah. nine. Well, Vortex clearing out this vision camp right now. Continue to do a good job of uh, roaming the map about a little bit. Uh, it looks like we do have a Doombringer going towards that third base of Vortex right now. So maybe a little bit of more harassment will end up going down. Uh, but yeah, maybe does not quite see that yet. There you go. We do have the Magmadons and uh, it doesn't look like he'll get too much damage there. Okay. Are we going to have this just get driven into the corner? I guess he doesn't see any opportunities to where he can actually use that drop. More creeping on the map. Um, we are getting up to four bases on both sides. I don't know what would prompt one player to attack the other at this point in time. And he is going to get that Magmadon out, but then decides to go ahead and pick <laughs> up again. He's going to destroy this Conclave here. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, thought maybe he, I was like, why? Like, So it doesn't like, turn does he really into want a to fiend. Get his Magmadons back to the very end of his base more quickly? Why would he do that? <laughs> yeah. um, all right. Well, that's just, a, I guess, a misclick. Um, yeah. Anyways, Vortex... Um, I think should be slightly ahead. I mean, they're fairly even on bases, but we've seen Vortex win a couple of fights. Mm -hmm. Well, I think a lot um, of it can come down to how these Magmadons end up getting micro against each other, right? Like if you get those stuns off, it's huge. Dude, there's such a bigger army here for Vortex though. Parting definitely in some trouble. Some great stomps going down on both sides. Almost looking a little bit silly there. Everyone's stunning each other bit of a stun party but parting is doing a little bit of drop harassment during this as well and sending his own fiends but it doesn't look like the fiends will get too much done yeah there's enough uh defense over there that the fiends just can't get in parting calls down a super um tower down here and, and is going to try to defend this position as best he can vortex is going to continue to advance up in here he has quite a bit 
Yeah, it looks like, you know, the Super Tower is helping out so much that Shroud Stone Summon is very important for the defense, but with nothing else there, it will get picked off. Vortex continuing to push forward. Oh man, we even have Gaunts over on this side, killing off all the imps that were on Ethereum there for parting. And Vortex, I think, is very close to winning this game. Yeah, I mean, this has been a crazy game. I'm so glad that we're going to be going into the next game with probably a Vortex win here. I mean, the reality is this base is going to fall. The Magmadons are doing too much damage. We already saw all the imps killed that were mining the ore down there uh, at the natural expansion here for parting. I mean, I think Parting's position is just going to continue to collapse. There it is, GG. Yeah. All right. Uh, so really, I, I, I love that. That was an excellent game. It felt like Parting had a bit of an advantage and Vortex just kind of fought back. Something about that weird Magmadon drop and then the attack into the natural expansion by Parting. Neither of those really ended up working out. It looked kind of fancy. It looked kind of cool. But at the end of the day, it felt like that kind of gave Vortex the chance he needed, and man, did he take it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess questionable moves there in the um, in the mid game there from Parting. Parting, I think, is, is probably playing the best early game we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Artosis. I don't know. It's it's been a crazy series so far. It it has indeed. Let's see what uh, Killer Pigeon thinks about that. You've been watching that game, right? Yeah, I've been watching all of them. They've been absolutely incredible so far. What an interesting switcheroo, right? We've seen different people taking the lead, looking for that all-in offensive timing and getting a, a mixture of results. But one thing I've got to say, actually, Artos, is from the, the games we've seen so far, although this is looking closer and Vortex is starting to pull it back a bit, I've still got to give brownie points to Parting for these, uh, well, let's just call them what they are, full baited builds, right? We saw it in Jagged Moor. And we saw it again in the Secluded Grove with the baited chop through. I mean, it's interesting to think how much of an advantage those type of cheeky, baity plays can get you in a series that is so long. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it really is huge. Just the fact that he's forcing Vortex to think that there is like an attack coming or think that there's a lot of units out and he's doing completely the opposite. It's giving him a huge advantage. But as we saw that game, right, if it's a little bit more even, Right. If he's if he hasn't mind gamed in some way that's giving him a huge advantage, Vortex has what it takes to fight back. Yeah, it's just a case of whether he gets a bit too wrapped up into the Yu-Gi-Oh, you activated my trap card meta. Right. And, you know, I think that's where Vortex has looked best when he just has his clear idea in mind and he's able to execute fully. I think one thing that was quite interesting to see uh, Tasteless from game three to game five, Broken Crown on both. We saw a very big difference here, right? Game one, Vortex tried to set the tempo. He tried to get in early for the dive with the Fiends. Cost him dearly as the game went on. And now, in kind of a mirror, it was Parting that made that first move to be on the offensive, yet we see Vortex with this all-in punch timing breaking through. It's, it's, it's really interesting. Like, Vortex, I think he's very, very dangerous if the game can kind of carry on and he's able to get to the late game, even though I think a lot of us were defining him as, like, a very aggro player. And he is aggro. He is strong in the early game. But um, Parting is doing a lot of really advanced stuff. I just didn't think we were going to be talking about this, right? Like, mining out the tree and then fast expanding or um, kind of playing into getting the catapult quickly, but not opening up the center of the map on Jagged Maw, just so that you can get a second base up, right? <laughs> I mean, these are like very different approaches. Um, but so far, look, it's been a very uh, exciting and, and thankfully very close series. Most definitely. I, I think one interesting thing to think about is, you know, although we've seen Parting come out the door with some creative strategies, got to give a lot of credit across to Vortex for his um, pivot. Because one interesting point, I think was back in game three, Artosis, uh, it was the, the cancellation on the Shrines. It looked like Vortex actually didn't cancel in time. So that one base all-inner was literally him in the moment going, okay, I have to win this right now mm. or it's over. That type of, of split-second decision-making is what makes champions. Oh, absolutely. Like, being decisive is one of the most important things, especially when you're an aggressive player like these two are, right? If you're playing a big, long macro game, you know, one little wrong decision may not end up ending the game for you, right? You have a lot of ways to kind of grind out advantages. But if you are in a position where you're attacking or you're behind a little bit, there may only be one window where you have a possible victory. So to see Vortex pick up on those and be able to pick up those victories definitely gives me hope that we can make it to the full nine games. 
Hey, fingers crossed, man. We get to listen to more you. We get to see some more amazing Stormgate. And you know what? It's the moment to see if Vortex is able to quickly pivot, quickly alter plans, because we just got confirmation in. Next up, we're heading back to Jagged Moor. Okay. Let's go on in Jagged Maw then, man. I, I, you know, again, we've talked about in a critical way, really, that this map does seem to lend to some one-dimensional plays because the catapults are, are, are too good. It would only <laughs> make sense to try to get the catapults right away, but then the game we casted on this map, Parting kind of acted like he played into it and then got a second base up and won from there. So let's go. Yeah, not sure exactly what we're going to end up seeing here. I don't think you can do the same thing twice here as parting. So I think we're going to see a completely different game here once again. I think so. Um, this does statistically have the shortest games. Like the map we just cast it on, a lot of great late games. Uh, I've even seen games where like the whole map is mined out. Jagged Maw, it seems like at high level play, it's a very explosive map. Mm -hmm. It usually allows one player to get enough of an upper hand that they, uh, they can crush their opponent. We'll see All if right, that's how it, <laughs> it goes down. Go ahead. We're in. Uh, all right. Anyway, sorry. But I'm running over you, Artosis. A pardon in the top right, Vortex in the bottom right. You go. All right. Uh, you know, this is this is the part where we're just kind of waiting to see, okay, is it going to be a crazy rush towards the speed camp? Is it going to be something a little bit more laid back? And the first thing we can notice, right, is that Parting made both buildings in his main base, whereas we're having one forward building, one building in the main base here for Vortex, which is a bit more common. Yeah. Um... Can we have a macro game possibly on this map, by the way? I mean, there's a lot of interesting concepts as far as like the role that drops would play if the game goes on long enough or the fact that, um, you know, I, I don't know if I guess, I guess there truly is a shared uh, base location in, in the center, right? If again, if we did have a late game, so fingers crossed, maybe we get surprised in a second time. We have initially pigeonholed as having only one way to approach it. Mm -hmm. So right now, Parting immediately throws down his uh, Shroud Stone, right, to help him with this. This is what he did in the previous game where he was really just focusing immediately. Look at this, the very first Gaunt coming out, putting the damage down. Uh, but immediately also we see from the other side here, uh, Vortex is cutting through the center and also going for the speed camp. Yeah, we've got the Imp over here to spot. We don't normally ever see a worker out here that's not being used to make a building right away. So this is another intriguing moment here. Mm -hmm. uh, this time from Vortex to kind of check on that. Um, and that's going to be keeping parting pretty honest. Meanwhile, at the center left, we've got more creeping coming down here. A lot of games on this map come down to that camp that we just saw Vortex take. But again, mm -hmm. parting seems to always have a kind of counterintuitive approach to how to creep on any map. Well, this, this has to be played very differently. Look at this. Vortex is coming up to challenge a little bit. Now, he has Brutes. It's just Ooh. Concaves on the other side for parting. So he's going to be able to make a bunch of Fiends and just overwhelm. Really well done by Vortex. I love this. He clears the Speed Camp, gets those extra Fiends, splits a Brute, and here he is. He's going to be able to take the Siege Camp down now. This is wild. Already, this game is completely out of control here. Now, parting is expanding. Vortex is not, but the catapult is now in the hands here. Um, a Vortex, I, I feel like this can't be winnable. No, I mean, no, you I can't. Mean, you there's no dead way, here, right? Parting cannot win this, this game. He it, really, if he wins, that. it's like, how would you possibly do that? <laughs> yeah, I think he's I, dead, I can't man. Imagine, it. yeah. He's basically going to let the uh, shrine making tank some damage just to buy some time in his main. Now, Gaunts are like made out of paper mache when it comes to these catapult hits. You cannot <laughs> yeah. let the cat... Yeah, if, if, if I, you have a direct hit on those gaunts, they just die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you got to be careful about that. Look at that. He's trying to make shroud stones. Those are going to be picked off. Look at this. His fell hogs turning on him and every fiend coming up to surround his gaunts. This is looking like it's game over. Oh GG is called and we got a 3-3 three, three tied up match now. Yep. Three minutes and 33 seconds. Make a wish, chat. <laughs> um, 
this is what I like about RTS is that it's not a fixed time for a game. You can have a game mm -hmm. that's an hour. You can have a game that's, uh, you know, a couple minutes. And that's what we got in that game. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I like that as well, right? Like it gives you a lot of variety. We don't have to play for an hour after you get that complete uh, one-sided stomp there. And the fact that now it's tied up three to three, like it really felt at the beginning of this series that parting was just out doing vortex in a lot of different ways, a lot of mind games and stuff. And now we see vortex. He's like, okay, I have an idea of what you're going to do here. Here's how I'm going to counter it. His play is a little bit more standard, but he's, he's tinkering with it just enough to beat parting's play, which seems to be not quite standard, but made to beat normal standard play. If that makes sense. That does make sense. I'm, I'm glad you phrased it like that. I mean, this is wild. Um, the odds of us getting like maximum number of games in a in a long series, like like say best of seven, you almost never get a game seven, right? That should statistically be even more difficult than a best of nine. But it looks like we're on the track to do that, Artosis. We are mm -hmm. already back into our next game. What is this game seven now? Um, and immediately, guys, Vortex here in the top right, Parting in the bottom left. Oh, oh, and whoa, whoa. Let's, dude, let's this is yeah. Party? <laughs> Artosis, yes. this is the build I do when I am streaming. <laughs> Which means he took it for me. Okay, pro gamer, oh, monkeys okay. can monkey do. Uh, <laughs> no, oh, this so is uh, he's okay, cheesing so, tasteless. Yeah, how am I not yeah. surprised? This is what you do on the ladder. <laughs> so this, I'll, I, I can explain this one. This is. Uh, let's see if he makes a second conclave or not. Yeah, he does. So this is a double conclave. At, um, uh, what do you call it a vault a push and you basically mm -hmm. just push into their speed camp uh you can bring your own imp if you want to try to open up the trees and hit from behind but in this case vortex is opening up the back door unknowingly for him mm -hmm. well i mean he's gonna have more units there's no question that parting is going to be ahead in that regard he should be able to win that speed camp over because of that and I mean, what do you do as Vortex at that point? If your opponent just has a bit more, this isn't the, the point in game where you're used to seeing like a shroud stone up or something, right? So I feel like Parting has looked at this, said Vortex is opening the same way every time. I'm going to punish it and punish it. He will. So this is going to be decided really quickly. If you can snipe the gaunt, okay, now, is he going to peek? He's going to use the high ground. You should have to confirm. Wait, does he split the uh, the brute? Yes, he does. He gets the first. Mm. Oh my god! Yeah. Oh man! Already oh a god. lot of damage there. Both sides losing their gaunts, splitting their brutes, and he sees how close it is. Right. So this is an important moment for Vortex. He realizes, okay, this is this is pretty cheesy. You're pretty far forward. Now, does he fall back into a more defensive stance, or does he battle for the speed camp? Oh my god! He's gonna come in here and intercept the the gaunt. Uh, I, this is hard for Intel who's winning. Uh, I, I mean, the fiends uh, seem to be even in number. I feel like Parting can't advance down the the hill. I think he has to stay here, mm. and he needs to get a brute. This honestly, I feel like Vortex is outplaying Parting right now. Like he's gotten a few more gaunt kills. Uh, obviously, we have the additional production facility, so Parting's still okay here. Uh, and you see, he's gotten that speed camp. He has those additional fiends. Ooh. How do you how do you stay alive here? Ooh, he actually aggro's that camp, but that wasn't the, the the move. He gets up, takes out this gaunt, gonna be able to fight these fiends as well, and in fact has a couple of his own left over. So parting definitely with a little advantage. Can we briefly check how many workers are in the main for each player from our observer? Because I I want to see how many how few or how many imps that parting has. Mm -hmm. So he has ten um on Luminite, two on uh or and then 10-4. So Vortex is ahead and he's getting a second base up. So this mm -hmm. means Parting has to like accelerate this attack and come in here for the kill. Now he's got enough creeps. He should be able to come um take out a lot of these units over here. Yeah, yeah. This 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 push is still very viable right now for Parting. Oh yeah. In fact, we do see that gaunt split right there. Uh unfortunately he loses another unit there as well. It, there's just not enough. He's gonna have to cancel out his shrine, I think. And in fact, there's so little here for Vortex. I just don't think he holds on at all. 
I think he's in a lot of trouble here. And keep in mind the Iron Vault, the only thing that can really help you right now is Brutes because the Gaunts just die immediately. GG, mm -hmm. the Iron Vault, yeah, you just, you're gonna, any Brute that comes out is gonna be surrounded and killed. What a game, Artosis. Ooh. This is going really fast. That was a four minute game. Um, okay, so parting is now up four to three. Mm -hmm. And that makes and it match five points point. to take it. Yeah, match point here for parting. Uh, definitely, uh, you know, it, he countered pretty hard what we've seen Vortex doing on Broken Crown, right? So that has been a big part of Parting's win so far is him kind of knowing how Vortex plays and countering it quite strongly. Uh, the thing is, I felt like Vortex was taking some good engagements there, but maybe didn't, did he not realize that there were three production structures? Because he kept coming out in the map while expanding. And it's like, well, if you're doing that, you're simply not going to have enough units. And and that's totally what happened there. Yeah, it seems like... I don't. I, 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 I do that all in a bunch, but I don't feel like I fully understand it in and out. But yeah, it seems like you cannot continue to advance on that, right? Because, um, you know, the Gaunt travel distance, once it's out in that part of the uh, the speed camp, it takes forever to get back into the main. The Gaunt mm -hmm. is just very slow. So the fiends can just run in there and then it just starts to snowball. So yeah. Yeah. This play yeah, for sure there by Vortex. You get that many fiends out, man. <laughs> it's so funny how quickly Gaunts <laughs> end up dying. It's like the units that are free absolutely destroy the units that you're buying. Uh and parting shows us <laughs> yes, that very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh we're back on Jagged Maw. All right, let's go, guys. This is uh hopefully not the final game, hopefully the second to last, if we can mm -hmm. get that lucky. A vortex in the top right and parting in the bottom right. Infernal versus Infernal. Kiwian was unable to make this a uh, Vanguard versus Infernal finals, but I'll tell you what, the matchup has turned out to be really interesting. We've had a lot of very different games. We've had some great macro games, some crazy cheese games. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, let's see what, what hand we get dealt with these two players as we go into Jagged Maw again. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, hoping that we do see a longer one here. Of course, this has been a very, very, very fast map. We have, uh, you know, over on parting side, it looks like he's going for the same build. And then Vortex is like, he has his Iron Vault. What is he? Is he just going to break through once again in the middle? Like, is this is this the counter strat? Is you just go in and you, you jack them while they're trying to get the uh, catapult? I guess so. Uh, in case you guys are wondering, by the way, because I know there's a lot of new people here, these rocks that the imp's tearing down, uh, it's just like the trees. Those are the trees for this map. Um, yeah, parting is he parting going to check? Mm, okay. Yeah, again, he, you gotta sees, use... he sees the imp, so it gives him time to react, right? Like, what yeah. can he change to make this work? Oh, that's what he can change. He cancels his plan. Yeah, this is sick. Okay, so he's gonna go back. Does he expand or does he just uh, kind of turtle it out? He's he's giving up on creeps. So Vortex is is gonna have an edge in, in that regard. It's right. gonna be tower on low ground. Well, dude, this is a big advantage to Vortex, isn't it? He's the one getting all the camps. We've had a canceled building. Basically, no creeping here at all from from parting. And I mean, he's just making shroud stones, right? <laughs> like, yeah. I I feel I feel like I'm watching a little kid play. You know, he's like, well, now I need my my towers up so I can't be attacked. Unfortunately for him, uh, <laughs> the catapult outranges that. So I'm feeling yeah, no, that, really that's good for so Vortex funny about here. It. Yeah. It's like yeah, it's like well, I better make buildings that the catapult will absolutely kill. <laughs> um, well, maybe he can tech into uh, tier two here and then try to get a weaver and harpoon the, the catapult. Oh man, on one base, that would be that would be pretty wild. Can you, uh, and can you get a, a, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Oh, I was just wondering if there was a possibility Vortex tries for both catapults here. I right? think he like probably, he, he probably could have, but he's, 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 well, actually you can kill the creep camp quick enough. That these almost come at the same time, right? I think if oh, you he turn around immediately and right go now. for it, maybe. But yeah, it looks like he Wait is. A minute. He's going to skip that for now. 
So is... this is high ground to low ground. Will this tower hit the catapult, or do you need to have vision of the high ground? Is that how this works? Yeah, okay. he's going to need to get vision, so I think that might be part of the plan here for parting. He's saying, okay, well, if you want your catapult to uh, attack, you got to come up here to get vision. So he's really abusing the mechanics of high ground versus low ground here. And in fact, his mascot's doing a great job, and suddenly the catapult is in range of this oh. trout stone. Oh. Is he going to kill it? Up. Oh. Catapult gets the kill on that, but the catapult is now taken out, so you don't have a, a, a weapon that can push this position anymore. Um, let's check where the... Uh, oh, that's it. GG. Okay, so Vortex just taps oh. out. Oh, that's it. Oh, we did it. It's over. <laughs> yeah. Okay, GG. Yeah, so sorry. Kind I was about of to a... say, let's check the progress on the shrines, but uh, that's it. Partying gets his uh, second base up earlier, and so Vortex just taps out. Yeah, that oh. is going to be that. It looks like uh, we have our victor of the tournament parting, taking down Vortex, uh, and that's going to be a 5-3 to three victory. Very well played from both sides. Really great yep. understanding of the mechanics of the game, especially by parting here, of the of the mind games, of the meta game. I, I feel like he really does deserve to be champion. I think the position of that first uh, uh, Shroudstone, the, the turret, is really deliberate. I think he has it set up in a way where it's possible for the um, uh, catapult to, to be in range of it because of the, the vision disparity from mm -hmm. the, whatever ground that was to the to one level lower. Um, look, Parting has played a really impressive series. A, a lot of nuance, by the way, on, on Jagged Maw there. Um, kind of playing, letting his opponent play into parts, like, like the, the objectives, I guess, for lack of better words, of the creeps on that map, but then exploiting it. Mm. Harden was not really winning with catapult pushes on that map. Like we saw everybody else who won on that map in this tournament, right? Um, so that's fascinating. Uh, and, and again, a whole bunch of very different games there. We had some long, dramatic ones. We had some uh, back and forth ones, uh, some super quick ones, so even three minutes and 30 seconds. But mm -hmm. uh, what a treat and what a big moment in history, Artosis. Parting uh, defeats Vortex five to three. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of been known and spoken about that Parting is, has been the strongest Stormgate player so far, and he really goes ahead and proves it. Basically, all the world's top Stormgate players so far in this beta phase uh, have participated in this Stormgate Open, uh, you know, by EGC TV, and uh, Parting ends up being the champion. He only dropped a few maps throughout as well, right? Like, what he what he lose to uh, Kiwi and he lost like two maps and then three to Vortex? Not bad, dropping very few maps yeah. to become the champion. Yeah, and, and uh, honestly, these players, they, we had so many interesting games. Um, if you're just now tuning in, you're not familiar with this game, um, it's still in beta, made by the OGs uh, at Blizzard that took care of StarCraft Two and WarCraft Three, And, um, you know, there's going to be a lot more to come mm -hmm. here with this. So this is a really exciting time to see that we had a finals that was this good, a tournament that was this exciting. We had a lot of... Um, a lot of great moments here, and it's only going to go up from here. Well, let's bring a uh, killer pigeon in, see what he's thinking about that that wonderful finals there between Parting and Vortex. I feel like I'm still dissecting what he done back in game three at this point. I mean, <laughs> Parting, what a phenomenal performance! You know, everyone's got their own way of playing Infernals, but I think it's fair to say, lads, no one quite plays it like Parting right now. Um, Looking back at the series, though, what a crazy one, right? I think even though it was Infernal vs. Infernal, we didn't get exactly what we wanted there, right? We wanted the Vanguard Infernal perfection to see the, the clashes. I think it's fair to say that we learned a lot about the, the way that these civs interact, Artosis. I think one of the mm -hmm. biggest takeaways is it seems like the, the opening plays are dictating a lot of the outcome, especially between these two players. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It really feels like the early game is setting up everything else in Infernal versus Infernal. But I mean, that's oftentimes the, the way things are in RTS games, right? You get your opening, you figure out, okay, who's ahead, who's behind, who's the defender, who's the attacker, who has map control, who has a better economy. And I mean, those things, when you get players of this level, like real champions from multiple games, you're going to see how they can abuse those little edges that they gain in that early game. And, you know, going on from the openers, that I think it'd be fair to say Vortex seemed to have a very good idea of how he wanted to establish the beginning of these games. I think one of the biggest highlights for me, Tasteless, was the adaptation by parting, right? Obviously, you know, we got to highlight the, the creative bait builds. We saw a few of those. But I think the other thing you could see slotted between that was a clear alteration of how he wanted to approach Vortex as an opponent. 
Yeah, well, he was able to cycle through different openings and approaches, and it shows you just how much labbing Harding has done uh, to where he has all these different uh, techniques he's imploring and, and, and creeping patterns he's, he's moving through. And um, even in some of these really short games, um, like the Jagged Maw ones, he was really quickly able to think on his feet. Like we saw him in that last game get scouted by the worker. Vortex is looking for it. He abandons the tower push on the creeps uh, and heads back. I, I just didn't expect there to be so much nuance in these games mm. with these two players just because of how new it is, right? Normally, uh, it's time that'll age an RTS game like uh, like wine, right? But we're seeing that these guys are coming here with so much knowledge from previous RTS games and, and putting that in. Uh, to the games they're playing right now, that we're getting some really interesting matches. Do you think part of that is also the pacing artosis, right? Like we were talking before we got on for the grand finals, you know, the beautiful thing about Stormgate, it feels like you hear some StarCraft people feel it's a little bit too slow. Age of Empires, people think it's a bit too fast. Well, hold mm. on, it's hitting this nice mid ground, it feels like between a lot of them. But the impressive part is even with that mid ground, maybe a slower pacing than some RTSs, just how quickly people have figured out all the small nuances. Well, if you look at like the history of RTS, right, uh, it feels like, uh, you know, the, the more Western scene has been getting so much better at RTS games for the past 15 years or so, right, since StarCraft 2 came out. Uh, and we've got like really big scenes, H2, H4, Star 1, Star 2, uh, you know, some of these other Warcraft 3 and things like that. Uh, and yeah, like these players that have been really good at multiple games for multiple years, are able to very quickly kind of dissect, okay, what are my tools here? What are my options? Like, what do I want to accomplish and how do I end up doing that in the most optimal fashion? And when you get a tournament like this, where you have a bunch of the best RTS minds going at it, it feels like the evolution of that is quicker than we've ever seen. Mm, especially when you combine the different backgrounds, right, Tasteless? Because it's almost like, you get these people who have been around since Warcraft in some examples, people who just stuck with Age of Empires on their own coming through. Um, sprinkle your other RTSs in. It's almost like that feeling where if everyone just came from one game, there might be a slower, I want to say, development of that meta as you have to figure out fresh things, things that you wouldn't have seen before. But when you've got all these people now flooding in, it's almost like you have to adjust much quicker because of all those backgrounds. Absolutely. And I think it's like, What's so cool about an online game like this is that it's like all these brilliant people coming together and trying to figure out how to do it best. And you're right, there's all these skill sets that are unique to each of the RTS games, like obviously Warcraft 3. That was the one with the creeps, right? Age of Empires has a different pacing and, and a different um, tempo to it uh, than like a StarCraft 1 or a StarCraft 2. But then even StarCraft 1 and StarCraft 2 are so different. Uh, so when you get something this eclectic and you pull all these players together... Um, and get to test stuff out, it's it's really interesting. And so I think you're right. If it was just like, let's say, only, um, you know, StarCraft 1 players had switched over or StarCraft 2 players switched over, I don't think we'd have as good games. But now with all these different RTS players coming together, um, yeah, it's a recipe for some really, really exciting strategies and, and games. Now, speaking of recipes, actually, I'm going to hone in on a specific game because I noticed you nerded out about it straight away, Tasteless. It was the Game 7, the proxy base, double Iron Vault, one Conclave. Uh, seems like you might be the master of this build. I don't know if you want to try to say part and copied you, but what what would have been the solution <laughs> yeah, in that particular game? What what could Vortex have done there to get out of that sticky jam? I I I think you have to disengage, but I don't I don't know. I mean, it it, it they both committed to fighting there. Um, most of the games that that I play, I I just win outright if I if I run into their base and do that, but um. Yeah, I mean, so much of it, I think, comes down to the the gaunt fiend interaction and who can actually take it. It's a very tactical moment. You have to take, I think, win with the gaunt, well, killing their gaunt, and and not just killing it, but also forcing the fiend out, and then try to to snowball it and push it from there. Um, but that's tough, especially when there's you know creeps like those uh, those goats, the speed camp. Um, it makes for a pretty explosive situation for sure. But I think probably go back and maybe just try to you know throw down defense. Okay, and uh, Artosis, I mean, you saw some more maps of it. You had uh, a hot feeling, or should I say feeling, um, a burning rage inside, actually, about how you feel about Jagged Maul. <laughs> After a few more games, I, I guess one way of kind of developing that conversation more, you guys hit on it in the cast, 
Can you actually play this game, this map as a late game? Can you play it as a macro game or is it just a, a doomed map in your eyes? Oh, I think the map is, this particular map is doomed 100%. Like, uh, obviously this is a mirror matchup, so there's like a certain amount of evenness there. And I really appreciated how Parting played it, where it was like, he was almost tricking his opponent into thinking the, the camps were important. And he, you know, and then he, he just counters that in some way. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think overall a map of that type of design, it just goes against so many fundamentals that we need, uh, to balance a game. So I, I, I think that, uh, in the next beta or whatever, we won't see Jagged Maw anymore. It's, it's silly. Yeah. Take it out back, shoot it, move on. I think, uh, one interesting thing as well with all those beta type plays tasteless is, you know, some people might look at this and go, oh, you just didn't want to show respect to Vortex. Oh, it, it wasn't good enough to, to read through it. I, I think it's the opposite, right? Like, the fact that Parting believed that each game Vortex would do the right thing, the meta thing, just shows you how highly he rated Vortex as an opponent. Yeah, I, my favorite Jagged Maw game was probably the one that, if we go back and look at the cast again, Artosis and I were the most confused at for a little <laughs> bit, which is where he, he didn't open up the middle but still got the catapult, and then he created the illusion of a committed push while he expanded. And the moment that um, Vortex was ready to intercept uh, the attack, or at least try to brace for impact, he, the Doombringer comes and scoops the Gaunts out and goes right back home. Um, and it was like, it was, it was, he completely uh, threw him off. So I, I don't, I, that stuck with me a lot too. I had some fun on that map. I do agree with Artosa. I think there's some problems, but at the same time, um, I don't know been fun seeing these two guys go at it well you know what we we can dive deeper into the minor parting uh, a very smart man one that, that left us puzzled even when we had the full picture uh we have the privilege of interviewing parting the winner of the egc stormgate open okay looks like we've got pying on the line pying uh, are you there can you hear us We'll give him a moment. <laughs> you know, he, he's, he's been for a best of nine. He deserves a second. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think we have some small technical hiccup. We're going to try and sort that so we can hear from, uh, from Parting himself. So I think, uh, like, we're already imagining a few obvious questions here, right? Like, we want to get um, his take in comparison to Artosis's on Jagged Moor. I definitely want to ask him what he thinks of the overall balance of the game and the direction. Um, but I guess actually while we wait for that, well, I want to quickly ask Tasteless and Artosis. We'll go to Artosis first. Um, you know, new, new factions still to be shown. Uh, have you already locked in who you want to play or are you very interested in anime cat girl waifus? <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, that sounds like a, that it sounds like a great faction. Honestly, I started and I've played more games as Infernal, but when I, when I went over and started playing some Vanguard, it gave me that Terran feel. And I mean, I've been a Terran player for 25 years, so uh, I've been enjoying Vanguard more, to be honest. And uh, so that's that's what I'm liking so far, but I'm withholding judgment and uh, I'll definitely try whatever uh, cat girl faction is coming out next. All right, what about you, Tasteless? Where are you going on that one? I mean, I, I have not committed to one side yet. I wanna... I started out like everybody else playing Vanguard because that's all there was. But I was, for the last um, but maybe two weeks, I've just been doing Infernal. I'm going to try to have a buddy of mine come over and teach me Vanguard. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been fun. I'm looking forward to the, the next faction, what's going to come out. So yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's where I'm at. All right. I think we figured out what the problem was. Uh, we can now head across to Parting. And I think, fingers crossed, we should have uh, the magical man himself to talk to. Okay, let's see if this works time. Parting, can you hear us? Uh, hello, sugar bears. <laughs> hey, congratulations, buddy. Incredible performance. Um, first of all, let me, let, let me just quickly dive into that grand finals. Uh, how, how did you feel going into that one? What was your, your read on Vortex? Were you confident that this was going to be an easy win, should we say? Or did you feel like this was always going to be a very close one? Oh, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Stress later. 
Sorry, say again. Oh, translator's not speaking. Translator, can you hear us? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, okay, let, let's try this one. Uh, simple questions. Uh, uh, I can, I can, I can answer. Oh, oh. About, okay, oh, okay, he back. All right. I'll, uh, okay. My bad, I'll translate. Uh, 먼저 원자 선수 승 경기 굉장히 우승 굉장히 축하드리고요. 어, 이 경기가 이렇게 어려울지 이렇게 어, 그냥 어려운 난 전, 경기가 됐을 거라고 예상하셨는지 어떻게 생각하셨는지. 어 일단은 결승에서 그 볼틱스 선수가 생각보다 좀 까다롭더라고요. 그래서 <웃음> 좀 어려운 승부가 될것 같았고 일단 그리고 멘탈적으로 좀 계속 제 자신한테 그좀 좋은 생각을 했어요 이길 수 있으니까 좀더 침착하게 하고 어 긴장하지 말고 여태까지 열, 연습 열심히 했으니까 한번 내 자신 믿고 자신감 가지고 한번 해보자 라는 생각으로 해서 이겼던 것 같아요 So, p a r i n g said You know, the on the final vortex was actually you know a bit more <clears throat> annoying and more technical, uh, complicated to uh, play against. So he thought it was kind of a difficult battle, difficult final. So he kept on telling himself in you know, a positive, uh, good thought, good kind of give giving him good mental. So he was like, all right, let's let's just kind of keep calm. Let's not get nervous. I've been practicing this a lot, so let's just play with high confidence. And you know, let's get good result. And turns out he did get a good result. And um, some of those games we saw what we were referring to as like bait plays. Was that always the plan because of how tough Vortex was? Did you feel like you had to do something very different, very surprising to throw him off? The game 도중에 Vortex랑 몇 경기 도중에 이제 어낙 미끼를 던지면서 좀 낚는 게임을 이제 변 낚는 그런 플레이를 몇번 하셨는데. 네네. 그게 원래 계획된 건지 아니면 보틱스 선수를 인지하고서 좀더 어, 바로 바로 살짝 직관적으로 바로 그 아... 하신 건지 물어보네요. 그 일단은 제가 이 게임을 거의 600시간에서 700시간 한것 같아요. 그래서 하면서 많은 상황을 제가 좀 알고 있어서. 상대에 맞춰서 제가 준비를 바로바로 바로 바꿔서 했고 네, 그 상대에 맞춰서 그냥 즉각적으로 바로바로 한것 같아요. 맞춰서. So parting practice this game played it for about 6 to 700 uh, hours now. So he's he's familiar with a lot of situations. He he has a good feel of the game. So he was actually able to adjust and react to a lot of situation on the spot without any too much of a preparation or too much of a, a plan ahead of time. Okay. And, you know, I, I guess I want to get his wider feelings on the game. Like, you know, we've just had a tournament on it, very early days. How does he feel about the direction of Stormgate, how it's being balanced, and what the future holds? Yeah, Stormgate is still very open beta and early days, but Stormgate's development and balance or the balance of the game 좀 초반 개발 상황을 보시면서 스톰게이트의 미래에 대한 어떤 생각 이런 의견이 있으신지. 어 일단은 이제 많은 사람들이 이제 프로스 자이언트 그 스톰게이트에 대해서 좀 좋게 생각하시는 분도 계시고 좀안 좋게 생각하시는 분들이 계신 걸 알고 있는데 근데 이 게임이 이제 나온 지 얼마 되지도 않았고 같이 이제 계속 피드백을 받아가면서 개발 중이기도 하고. 근데 제 방향 게임 안에서 해보면은 그 방향성이 느껴지긴 해요. 아이 개발자분들이 어떤 걸 하고 싶구나, 어떤 RTS를 만들고 싶구나 그런 게좀 느껴져서 진짜 재밌게 하고 있 하고 있고 그리고 미래가 더 저는 기대가 돼요. 많은 분들이 지금 실망하시는 분도 굉장히 많 많지만 저는 프로스트 자이언트가 지금 굉장히 일을 잘하고 있다고 생각합니다. So. A lot of people have you know, good and bad opinions about Frost Giant, but you know, this game is still early days. It just came out very recently. Uh, it's still going through a lot of development from a, a feedback from the players. And Parting himself thinks you know, he can really kind of get a feel of what the developers are trying to do with this game. They're, he can really tell what kind of RTS they're trying to make, and he's really enjoying the game so far. So Parting is very 
excited about the future of this game. Uh, he's aware that a lot of people are disappointed about the game, but he has faith in Frost Giant, and he really thinks this game is going to be a good game in the future. That's refreshing to hear. Uh, uh, Tasteless, Artosis, have you got anything you want to ask Pai while we've got him here? Uh, sure. Actually, I, I, I wanted to check because, you know, Parting is obviously still a super high level StarCraft two player. He's playing a lot of Stormgate and has been pretty dominant in that uh, and obviously is a very popular streamer. So what what is the, the future here for you, Parting? Are you planning on, you know, just continuing kind of streaming and playing on the side? Are you going to rededicate yourself to StarCraft 2? Are you kind of waiting for Stormgate to come out and maybe become the world champion in that game as well? What What is the future for Parting? Uh, 예, 이원의 선수는 지금 이제 이 상황에서 어떻게 미래에 하실 건지 이제 방송을 조금 뒤전으로 두고 그 게임에 집중을 하시는 건가 아니면 방송은 병행하시는지 뭐 스톤게이트를 월드 스톤게이트 월드 챔피언을 목표로 하시는지 일단 원의 선수의 그런 방향이 어떻게 되는지 궁금하답니다. Okay, first I never ever betray to my fans sugar bears and mean is I will keep doing streaming and of course, I want to be a world champion of Stormgate, and I find I find in my glory, and then I will share my uh, feeling with my fans. That's my purpose and my uh, goal, life goal. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, Tasteless, anything you want to ask? I guess just uh, I'm curious to hear his thoughts on Jagged Maw and what he thinks of the map. Jagged Maw라는 맵에 대한 의견을 물어보네요. 지금 아까 방송 중에서 밸런스 의견 많이 나왔었죠. 아그 많은 분들이 이제 저 맵을 싫어한다고 생각하는데, 근데 저 맵은 좀 똑똑한 사람이 잘하는 맵 같아요. 그러니까 좀 머리 쓰는 이 제가 왜 스톰 게이트를 좋아하냐면. 이게 다른 이제 기존 RTS와 또 아, 다른 RTS도 머리를 당연히 써야 되지만 저 캠프 이제 크립 캠프 때문에 약간 플레이들이 빌드 오더라든가 그런 게 많이 바뀌어요. 그래서 제 생각에는 좀 머리를 써야지 저 맵을 좋아하지 않을까. 똑똑한 사람이 저 맵을 좋아하지 않을까라고 생각합니다. So Parting is aware that a lot of people do not like that map, but he thinks the map is it plays strongly to uh, smarter players. Uh, you know, the RTS in general obviously requires a, you know, a thinking, a lot of brain power, but he likes uh, parting like Stormgate a lot because you know the creeps really affect the build order and you know change it how you need to play. And he thinks Jack and Maul it really brings out that aspect of the game. So he actually likes that map a lot. Wow. Uh, okay. There, there we go. We we have our answer from the champ. Um. I, I think we've kept parting long enough. Um, just an opportunity for him to say anything he wants to to, to the fans, to everyone watching. Um, speak. 마지막으로 mind. 마지막으로 할 팬들이나 이제 시청자들한테 하실 말씀 있으신지. Uh, for, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank to Frost Giant and Easy C uh, for giving me big, great opportunity chance to win this tournament and a very thank a grateful to my fans sugar bears i always want to re repay to my fans they always trust me believe me uh, cheer me uh, they gave me big power and motivation and also thank to my team new team aftermath they trust also they trust me and <clears throat> they have a good practice uh, my partner his name is uh Diri, Diri, Diri and Arbino they helped me a lot they didn't sleep and didn't eat like 24 hours practice me for me so very thank you for uh, thank you to them and i love you guys and I love Frost Giant, I love Tasteless, Atosis, 
and killer vision and i love you all peace thank you fighting uh, much love to you as well congratulations buddy you go get some rest and i'm sure we'll see you again soon adios Ah, wonderful to hear from the champ himself. I like how he basically walks in, um, indirectly calls Artosa stupid, and then Adios is out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I like that too. Thanks. Thanks for pointing that out, Killer Pigeon, for anyone who may have missed that. <laughs> I, I mean, it's classic chump, isn't it, right? You bring up uh -huh. maybe a balance issue, just says, get better. Just, just get better. Says the infernal player. It's wonderful. I love it. This mm. is just the story of my life for 25 <laughs> years, and hopefully another 25 as well. Ah, man. Hopefully, uh, hopefully Stormgate's going to have a big part in it. I mean, it's time for the rounding <laughs> thoughts on, on the tournament as a whole. I mean, we, we talked a little bit about how we feel at the start of the day. Now that we've seen um, enough games of Jagged Moor to remove all the hair from your head, Artosis, <laughs> um, how are we feeling about the future of, of Stormgate as a, a competitive environment? Yeah, I mean, it, it it's super fun. And the more that you play, the more you find that you're able to do in the game, right? I think that is a very important thing. Like the the multitasking stuff is starting to build up a little bit. You're seeing a lot more like drops and, and micro in different areas, different strategies coming out. And the thing is, it's so early that, you know, to start seeing that this early is very, very nice. And as more things get added in, I think we'll have more tools. I'm personally very excited about the, the future of Stormgate. I've been enjoying playing it a lot. I've been playing it a ton, watching so many games casting games uh and i think it's great so far I, i'm looking forward to the future and seeing where they go next with it i i love someone that's kind of highlighted there is, is the idea that it's very intuitive right tasteless i think that the cool thing that i always look for a game that i think can be incredibly successful is is simple to pick up but hard to master and although it's still an rts although you're still in 1v1 and maybe you accidentally queue into parting on the ladder the reality is i think for a lot of people what frost giant have done in the way they designed this game and the the nuances, the way that they design the UI as well, and the, the UX, they seem to want anyone to be able to pick up a play. Yeah, I, I agree. I think you said it very well. I mean, it, it's easy to pick up, but almost impossible to master. And um, I've been having a lot of fun playing Stormgate. In fact, I, I know I'm hooked on a game where when I'm sleeping, I dream that I'm playing the game. Like, that's how much it's uh, it's inside my mind. Um but yeah, I, I, look, I mean, we don't even have tier three units yet. We don't have the third faction out. Um, you know, we've had a couple maps that have been thrown together, but there's still so much more uh, that's going to be unlocked here. So I don't know. Feels good, man. It feels amazing, my friend. Uh, it's been an amazing experience having you both here, but I think you've uh, earned a rest. I'm excited to see more of you in the future. I'm excited to see more from EGC and more from Frost Giant. Uh, but thank you, Tasteless Nartosis. I, I think it's time for me to do my ramble and close the show, but I'm sure we'll be seeing plenty more of you on the mic. Thank you much, man. It's been great. Thank you for having us. Cheers. Absolutely wonderful to have the two lads in. Incredible grand finals. If you just tuned in and you missed it, that's right. Parting took the dub. Absolute mad lad. Unstoppable in the end. Able to close it out in the eighth game with a 5 free storyline. And well, you, if you missed the interview, go back. I think there was some interesting insights there. Um, the man loves Jagger Moore a little bit too much, maybe for my, my liking as someone who's taking to the vanguards. But I think what we're seeing is uh, an eSport in its early days, one that's got so much still to offer, and I'm excited to be along for the ride. And I think I want to thank everyone that's made it possible. You know, EGC putting this $10,000 tournament together, which came out of their very own pocket, by the way. And of course, couldn't have been done without the assistance of Frost Giant to make sure that we had at least what we needed as a bare minimum to get a spectating tool go early on. And, you know, I, I know there's been a lot of talk about balance and getting things right and getting things perfect. But, you know, that's not where the beauty of an esports scene is, if I'm being totally real with you. If you think of all the great experiences you've had along the way, the memorable moments in so many grand games, it's the, the hardships, the way it builds itself up, even with the flaws existing, that makes a true champion in the esports world. And that's why I'm excited to see what Stormgate has in the future. I mean, this was just with two factions and three maps on rotation. Imagine where we're at when we've got eight, nine maps, when we've got anime cat girls flying around our bases and lasering down everything with angelic wings. I'm giving away too much information about what's coming up for the game. But what I can tell you is I'm almost certain 
that EGC will be back. I will definitely aim to be back. I'm sure many of us will. Big shout out to all the casters as well. It was amazing to see us bring together faces from Warcraft, Starcraft, Age of Empires, and I'm sure there's a few places there I'm forgetting along the way. Same with the players as well. I think the beautiful thing we've got here is, you know, a game that, as I said there, is maybe intuitive, easy for people to pick up. And I always like to compare it to, to something like a, a, a Valorant situation, right? All the people, I'm sure there's plenty in the chat that have looked at games like Counter-Strike and they've sat and gone, you know, I'd love to play this, but I don't like the idea of just getting stomped on for 50 hours to figure out the basics. New game comes in, sets you up for a nice little reset, lets you get going again. And I think that's maybe what Stormgate's going to be for a lot of us. I think it's actually wonderful that they're focusing on the 1v1 as well as the co-op, the team game experience being different, even the single player. So if you guys haven't already, I do recommend following their page across on Steam, making sure that you are hearing all the deets they come out. And be sure to check out their Kickstarter. It's going to open up again on the 23rd of uh, February, I believe the goal is going to be when we last got the update. So if you want to pledge there, get access to the Bayer, that's one way to do it. Um, but I think it's time we bring it to a close, folks. It's been absolutely phenomenal. Parting will be our first major Stormgate champion. The mad lad from Korea, he looked unstoppable from the get-go. And although some people were able to crack a few games away from him, dropping five overall, in the end, there was no denying the beast from the East. It's time to come to a close. You've all been absolutely phenomenal. Hopefully, we'll see more EGC. Hopefully, we'll see more of you soon. For now, farewell.